Whoa. Well, this is one crazy thing I just found out about him thanks to the chat, Robert. What, what this guy's that? updated FIDE rating is 2420. 24, what? 120. Are he's you... gained 400 rating points since September. Are you kidding me? No. So then he's the single best. The In fact, be he gained 200 of them last month and 100 the month before. Oh my. God. 150 the month before that. He was actually down to 1,900 in November <laughs> from September. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so I don't know who this is, but this was a, yeah. a, an ingenious pickup for this team. This is actually the single most valuable player in the league, in the entire league. Like if this it could, could be. That's I mean. unreal. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third Battle Royale of the Pro Chess League. I'm Grandmaster Robert Hess, here with the one and only International Master David Pruis. David, I know it's early for you on the West Coast. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's early, but um, I've been waiting since uh, Tuesday for this, so let's do it. <laughs> it is Battle Royale. Are there, I'm, I'm going to pull up um, the standings here just before the week. We have some very good teams in our uh, Battle Royale today. We have teams like the Amsterdam Mosquitoes, and I have the standings up on the screen right now. They're in fifth place in the Central, and I kind of highlighted them because I liked their lineup for the week. I feel like they're going to be quite strong, and they're in fifth place trying to fight into the, those playoff spots. So, David... Um, yeah, Dave... They've brought out a lot more power now that Wake on Zay is over. <laughs> That's exactly. And Van, and Van Four East, it's like a whole different team. It's like, here's the A squad. Yeah, they brought some of the Dutch stars here. And I have all boards and this template here. So all mm -hmm. boards for each team, like you said, Van Willy, Van Forest, they, uh, you know, they, they drive well here with their, their vans, and they have brought their A squad, the, some of the Dutch superstars, and I really think that they're going to make a push for the playoffs now that Wykenze is over. Yeah, um, fair enough, fair enough. But there's going to be intense competition today. I think um, from watching the first Battle Royale in very, very close detail that it's actually kind of hard to predict which team is going to win. Okay. Even if one team looks good, uh, I think almost every team has its strengths and its chances here. I completely agree with you. And other players 
well, other teams that should be happy that White Gonzaga is over the Khan Blitzstreams because they've got yeah. Jan Christoph Duda. And, okay, I'm going to be honest with you, that's the player I'm by far the most excited about because, yeah. okay, Duda is Same. just the beast. And we saw him in the Speed Chess Championships. And Same. Also, I, pick, I picked him for my fantasy team for sure. <laughs> that seems like a pretty safe and smart bet, but <laughs> you never know when other board ones include Dimitri Andrakin and Vita Gujarati. Yeah, yeah. I definitely hesitated about those two as well. Um, and uh, yeah, finally went with Duda anyway. I mean, he's done really well in the Blitz battles, as you've seen. So um, he's clearly quite good at rapid chess. So. Yeah, and he'll need the rest of his team to step up. And they're on board four over there. They have Kevin Bordy, who is a popular streamer on yeah. Twitch. So they'll hope that, well, their team name is in honor of him. Right, blitz streams. So hopefully yeah. that he can lead the charge from the bottom board. And just to remind everybody of the the format here for the Battle Royale, instead of the typical Pro Chess League uh, weeks, which it's board one plays board you know, four, then three, then two, then one, here right. it's you only play the board one if you're on board one for the opposite team. So I think it's a little more exciting in some ways because instead of having some necessary I don't want to be this harsh, but some free points here and there. It's just you're yeah. playing everyone around you. You could just reading. call them mismatches, right? There we go. You're, like, so, you're so diplomatic. It's like slightly less harsh, but it's still descriptive in the same way. I love that. That is the very diplomatic way of, of putting that. So. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to wait two hours to see two 2700s play each other, right? Like in a normal match, you might, you might have to wait to round four. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of new names here today as well. And one of the teams that looks really good to me is the Volga Stormbringers, which is basically all new players this week, other than on Draken. Yep. Um, Oparin, I'm like 99%, 100% sure it's his first match. Um, he should be quite good at Rapid, I think. Um, at least since I put him on board two of my fantasy team. He better be. <laughs> and then, then they've got Dimitri Froljanov and Leia Garufulina. And I think they're all making their debuts. So this is like a whole new Volga team, pretty much, minus, you know, their top gun. Uh, I kind of would guess that they'll be somewhere near the top. Yeah, absolutely. And all the games are underway. I see, I mean, okay, I'm following all the action, but I see some matchups mm-hmm. that are particularly interesting to me. Vidit Gujarati is playing Abhijit Gupta, so it's an India matchup already in the first round with Vidit having the black pieces against Abhijit Gupta, who is no tra- stranger to success in the Pro Chess League. And in this game, it's actually a, a, sort of an odd situation here where Vidit is snaking his bishop from b4 to a5, and once white plays pawn to b4, that bishop will probably find its home on c7. All right, I'm going to try and find the same game as you, and I've got it. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, keeping that bishop, huh? <laughs> Which is very atypical of this position. I think the move, <coughs> you know, 92 c6 is one of those moves you reserve for rapid when you're no longer playing yeah. Magnus Carlsen, and your op- opposition, while still strong, is not quite as high level. This C pawn move so that black can't get the pawn on D5, that's kind of a move that we see in some lines of the uh, Rosalimo Sicilian as well. Right. And uh, it, looks like, it looks like it worked out pretty well for white here so far. Yeah, white's position is very spacious, right? You've expanded on the queen side over here. Yeah. <laughs> spacious is a good word. <laughs> I love that, yeah. <laughs> it just it's feeling you know, roomy. And yeah. Uh, the problem, though, is white is so far behind in development. So I can see, especially if you go knight f4 and then black plays e5 and just tries to break very quickly, I could see yeah. how white's position is a little bit dangerous, I guess. Yeah, the one problem with the knight on e2 is that black can sort of play e5 at will. Uh, unless white plays the undeveloping but spacious move f4 here, which I'm not recommending. But other than that, e5 is coming next. Yeah. And that'll get black into the game, I guess. Yeah, and and also on the other side, right? Black can play b5 and follow up with a5 in the right moment. Mm -hmm. The queen on d6 seems perfectly located to attack on both sides of the board. How surprising (laughs) that black's position would be this good. I mean, we might be overstating it. I might be, I should say, because Vidit has the black pieces, and I can't imagine him just doing something totally terrible. Just doing something totally garbage, yeah. But it's always possible, right? Especially when the time control gets shorter, these players have no problem uh, getting a little crazy. 
Yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll see you'll see something weird in a rapid game. Just it can happen. Yep. Can White play knight to b5 and pawn takes e5? No, queen d1 check. Yeah, but knight b5 takes pawn takes. Those are some things you always have to keep an eye on if you're black. And this kind of sacrifice, yeah. but unfortunately, doesn't work just at the given moment. Yeah, I was just wondering if that was why he played bishop b2, but no. No, he just doesn't want to develop his, his king side. Look, I mean, queen c2, right? <laughs> yeah, this is the curse of like people who are afraid of doubling their pawns in the Nimzo is like they just keep making moves that don't involve the bishop on f1. Yeah, this is, uh, and that's why- They're always trying to perfect another little something on the queen side. <laughs> and that's why Vidit has not taken on d4 yet, because as soon as you take on d4, then this knight will recapture on d4, and that bishop has some new, a new lease on life, and it can finally develop, so white can castle. But what if white castles queen side? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Then, then black plays a5, I would guess. <laughs> you know, it just, it's just one of those... Th well, it's hard to castle kingside because it takes several developing moves. And I really like this move queen e7 because you're just freeing up to cap recapture an e5 with your bishop now. And you still have ideas but, with a5 on the queen side. So I think also very importantly, he's discouraging knight to g3 or anything like that because of pawn takes pawn. So um, if white had any intention of ever developing his kingside, but it's like... Eh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Just play rook to c1 or something. Pile up on the c file, right? That's that's your pawn break with b5. Maybe you can play that too. Yep. I mean, a5 with b5 tied in there. Uh, what else can you play? You can play... Uh, I don't know how to attack your light squares because when you play g3, now I immediately want to put my bishop on like f3. But of course, yeah, as soon as... h5, like, h4, h3 here maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Super just like, you know... Oh, I like this. Rook d8 attacking this knight on d4. Rook d1, yeah. I guess, is the move to respond He's with. like, shoot, white woke up and decided they needed to move the bishop on f1. I'd better do something now. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we'll see how this game continues. Are there any other games that have caught your eye? I mean, there's just so many different games are going on, so it's hard to... Oh, sorry, I was, I was fixated there, but we should probably try and find Duda, right? The Polish fighter. Yeah, where is um, he? Playing black against GM Niklas Huschenbeth. Okay, I, I pulled up that game and I immediately want to leave because I'm... Okay. It's a... Uh, Let's already, go. We're in an end game already where both sides have two rooks and two minor pieces, and I think Huschenbeth perhaps very wisely chose a line with not too much bite in it, trading queens and... Okay, I mean... I look at this position, yeah. I think that perhaps white is slightly better because of the pawn structure, and the bishop on the light squares doesn't really have that bright of a future to work with, but then I see the rating of the player with the black pieces, and I'm like, yeah, he'll make a draw. Like, Whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It'll be okay. All right. I'm, I'm, click, I'm, I'm clicking around, seeing what I can see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the same. Just, I'm trying to find an attack. How about game. this position between Zavin Andreasian and Loic Van Welly. This is the game that, to me, seems the most developed. Okay, I pulled <clears throat> I pulled this game up here. You got that, King Loic as black. Yeah, I got it. And uh, Zavin Andreasian is on the Armenian Eagles. And when I had to pick some team to win this battle royale, I picked the Eagles because they're champions. And they usually find ways to score a little bit more than you think they would if you just look at their ratings and their players and stuff. Yep. Um. But if you look at this position, it feels <laughs> like it feels like Van Welly's getting to work on the queen side. <laughs> this looks amazing for Black because you know if, when you play this kind of king's in the attack as white, you're trying to get an attack. Like there is literally the word attack <laughs> in the opening name. Yeah. And I don't see an attack. This bishop on e7 covers a very important f6 square. Black is already just cruising on the queen side. The a2 pawn might already be going down, and uh, yeah, I don't even see how Black. Excuse me, how white gets an attack because bishop g5 is never possible with this queen and bishop tied to that square. So yeah, it's looking so brutal. I'm like feeling like the pawn in h6 is in the way of white's pieces, even <laughs> though I think my I think my conscious mind understands that lodging a pawn in h6 is a normal step in an attack, but it feels like it's blocking white's pieces. I just don't even see the next move. <laughs> and b4 and, b3 uh, is coming. B4 b3 is coming with a knight outpost on a2. <laughs> That's awesome, a knight outpost on a2, but it's true. Look at how well defended that knight is. You got the other knight and the bishop, and you can't actually dislodge any of Black's pieces. So this looks like Lok van Wille, you said, the Dutch team, the Wijkense is over, 
They, okay, but yeah. now after you take on f6 here, there's yeah. going to be no attack. After I think just don't take back on f6 with the queen. And then basically there's just too much stuff locked. It's like a locked position on the king side now, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> if Mike doesn't take that f6 pawn and open bishop e5, there's... Yeah, this is looking tragic. <laughs> and, and what's the... It's called an umbrella? Is that what these pawns are called, right? When they're advanced pawns for a side that look attack like they're attacking pieces but they actually protect the enemy king i think it's called an umbrella so right oh, now yeah. you have i call them traitor pawns that's my <laughs> terminology but i know that i invented it myself i so like that honestly it's, it's not it's not out of the textbooks I, I'm, I'm a fan of that terminology there so it's just completely over for zavin andriastin and this one and that's a very bad start yeah. for the armenia eagles considering that well you have the white pieces and this is one of the technically more favorable matchups when you have Vidit Gujarati, Duda, Bakro, all these big names on board one of the other teams. Yeah, those pawns are on autopilot too. You saw Van Wel, he's not thinking about his moves anymore. Yeah. He's like, if you say check, I'll capture the piece checking me for one second and then get back to pushing my pawns. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just, no. it's too simple, right? And the knight on c3 also, def you know, helps the b1 square push. This is just completely over. So we know Van Wel will win this. What? Uh, let's check How do you out. feel about looking at a weird board four game? Are I'm, you down with the board I, fours? I'm totally happy to do that. All right. Um, you can look for Vinny the Pooh, not Winnie. Oh, Vinny. oh, I see Vinny the Pooh. I got Vinny the Pooh. Yeah. And Black has, you know, sacked in exchange, just like Petrosian and all, right? So, yeah, so he is... doesn't know he's on board four. He's trying to do the real stuff. <laughs> so he's down just in exchange, but this rook on C2 is the best piece on the board. And the yeah. knight on D3 probably is Just tied. A second. Yeah. But I guess the question is, David, I mean, I like this idea with Bishop B4 offering the trade. And, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, once we trade on D4, so let's say black takes, white takes back, the next move is going to be king to G1, and then the E4 pawn feels a little bit loose. So is white yeah. in time to do something like this, or is black going to find a way to then be able to push the pawn to E3? That's really the vital question in a position like this. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the defense of the e4 pawn is vital, whether black takes on d4 or plays bishop c7 or whatever, you know, the question is going to be, can he maintain that pawn and thus maintain the knight? Because once, once he has to retreat that knight, he's going to sort of start to lose his bind. Um, I mean, black can at least get a pawn on a2 out of all this, so... I like, he won't be down so much. Wow, I love this move, bishop c7. because That's yeah, what I would have done too. Yeah, it just keeps that king stuck to the g3 pawn. Although, mm -hmm. if the king goes to g1, then the e4 pawn is immediately hanging. So it's one of those mm -hmm. trade-offs that the consequences are not totally clear. I Actually, maybe king g1 is a good move. It might be. Then bishop takes g3, bishop takes e4, and if knight f2, white has bishop takes c2. So Yeah, you don't... You can't really afford, it looks like, to give up this pawn e4. Although there's bishop so, h2 check and like king h1, then knight f2 check ideas, perhaps winning mm -hmm. back some material in a strange way. Right, that would get get him out in time. Yeah, that's very weird. The other move that we always have to look at is bishop to d5, rook to f5, kind of. Exactly. When white moves the king. Yeah. Um. And, and sort of the battle around that e pawn. And, and if, if white can play rook takes d3, maybe that would destroy my idea. Right, right. So bishop d5 is probably going to be met by an eventual rook takes d3. Mm. Yes, king g1 played. So <coughs> both these board fours are playing pretty great chess right now. I'm impressed already by seeing a player with a rating of 2044 with the black pieces and a 2200 with white. This feels like a pretty high quality game. And yeah, I clicked to it because it seemed because it seemed real. It seemed like Grandmaster Chess instead of I mean, this guy's rating is officially two thousand forty four. It doesn't look like uh, like that to me at the moment. And th that's the exact type of player you need for your team, right? Low rating, so that w way your other boards can be uh, even higher rated players, but really has a good understanding of chess and can do some damage. And here, Bishop he's going down your line. He's going down your line, Robert. That's either a good thing for him or a really horrible thing. I haven't figured it out. I yet. think your knight f2 idea is pretty solid here. So I think it's I think it's a fine sign for him. Yes, yeah, so knight f2. It's probably the only way out, honestly, for black. At this point, yeah, with that knight in that shape, there's only one move. And, and now there's an option, right? You could take the bishop on h2, which then yeah. if you take on h2, then black will play knight takes e4 with check. 
Yeah. You know, that king Any is... other discovered check allows bishop takes rook. Exactly, right? The rook is under attack. So you take the bishop instead of the rook, but then the king is forced back to g1, then the h3 pawn is hanging, and it's looking pretty dangerous. So I would probably take this knight on f2 if I'm white. But then that still also looks pretty tough because a2 is hanging, then followed up b3 will be hanging. I'm not certain about the... And h3 is hanging on the other side of the board. I think black is just better here. Whoa. Well, this is one crazy thing I just found out about him thanks to the chat, Robert. What, what this guy's that? updated FIDE rating is 2,420. 24... What? 120. Are he's you... gained 400 rating points since September. Are you kidding me? No. So then he's the single best... In most... fact, he gained 200 of them last month and 100 the month before. Oh, my... And 150 the month before that. He was actually down to 1900 in November <laughs> from September. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know who this is, but this was a, yeah. an, an ingenious pickup for this team. This is actually the single most valuable player in the league, in the entire league. Like if this it could could be. That's I mean, unreal. Yeah. Wow. I am just in disbelief and he, he's playing extremely well in this game. With this White one. White underestimated this king takes h2 variation because after knight e4, his king is actually still boxed in. Black has time to grab the pawn in h3, and he's looking at devastating checkmating threats here with rook g2, knight g3. Yeah, in fact, um, I don't see how you stop this checkmating threat. Okay, now bishop g4 is one of the many good-looking options here. You can still go rook g2 check with knight f2 check to follow. Um, you can still go rook g2 and recover the exchange. Yeah, but bishop g4 feels... feels I think I'd rather give up my bishop than my knight in this position, but I'm not positive. I say that as a question rather than as a statement. Vinny the Pooh has offered a draw. White has offered a draw um, briefly after playing rook f3. Um, Black's got a lot of good moves here. Rook g2. Simple and solid, but white might be able to eke out a draw. Might. I mean, it's two connected past pawns. That's tough. Yeah, this just feels... And also, white's already down one pawn. At the end of a lot of variations, the A2 pawn will be lost. So, yeah. uh, it, it's... I don't... Uh, it's tough here. Mm hmm So, okay. So, this is looking good. I'm just trying to keep an eye on... Because as games enter time trouble, it's nice to right. go around to see how people are doing. But Manu David Suthandram looking real good in this first game with the black pieces. I mean, I, I'm very impressed so far with his play. And like, like we said, he's, he's 2,400 live rating. Most, most valuable player in the entire league. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I haven't seen anything like that yet on any of the players I've come across. Yeah, and usually they're like 12 years old, and it looks like he's 17. So maybe just a late bloomer. In, um, in terms of chess. But I, I have to bring us back to the game between Lok Van Whaley and Zavin Andreasa. Yeah. Because I w that's the puzzled look on my face. Is like, <laughs> well, this is not as bad as it should have been. This game should be over. and should have been over a while ago, but somehow Black's knights are awkwardly stuck to each other. Right. It looks like minus one instead of minus ten. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, just... It's I don't know if those numbers mean anything, but just my feelings. Yeah, and, and it's one of those positions... If, White is like a couple moves away from perhaps playing f4 and then t sacrificing the rook for two of the knights. And so f4 is played. And once you just get in an exchange down position, you might be able to build some kind of weird fortress. Like I, I'm not quite as in love with Van Wey's position as I was before, but I st it still should be winning. Like that, that's my initial take. But it really looks a lot more difficult than it did uh, several moves ago. So to untangle people watching might want to play something like rook c8 and then knight to b4 to d5. But if rook to c8, white can play rook takes on a2 with the a1 rook. Yeah, that's a pin. So I'm not sure how to set up. I don't know. That's the most obvious way to try and do something. But look, it happened here, right? So that <coughs> this is exactly what I was fearing for Van Wey. You're up in exchange. That much is clear. But mm -hmm. your king is always going to be in trouble. The bishop on e5 is extremely well placed. And white can also try to just play king h4, pawn g4, and claim you're never going to actually attack my pawns anymore. 
uh, I'm quite safe over there. You might get checkmated in some weird lines, but yeah. it looks pretty safe to do that. And just, as long as white keeps that one rook on the board, I think black will have a very hard time winning. If the rooks get traded, I think black will win easily because all look at all the black pawns are on light squares. Impossible to attack with just yeah. a dark square bishop. But with I think the only real target for black is going to be the white king because it's so hard to get at white's pawn structure. So like depending how white sets up, like g4, king h4, you could imagine black could double rooks on the third rank and basically checkmate white. Yeah. Um, but I, I so think that'll be kind of like the hope for black, I would think. I think this is already a, like kind of a fortress, though. I don't see how black makes any progress as long as white just keeps this rook on right. either C, you know, A or C or D file, wherever, the B file now. Right. I just don't know how you make any progress. You have to. I think it's also good that White took the third rank with his rook, covering g3, and yeah, I think because that would be sort of like where you would try to attack from Black if you could get both your rooks free. No, absolutely. And this is what I was telling you about the Eagles, man. Like that <laughs> position when we first looked at it, it, we basically both thought it was a joke, right? Yeah, we thought the position was a joke. Like he's he's not playing anymore. It's you know Van Wel, he doesn't even have to think, and uh, you know. Look at this. Andre Ozian still in the game. I, I think this is already a draw. Like, I, I yeah. don't see a way for Black to really make progress. Okay, with, in time trouble, mistakes will definitely occur. But as long as Andre Ozian keeps doing this, where these rooks for Black are tied down. Because if you give up the 7th rank, then I'm immediately putting pressure on the F7 pawn. And if you give up the 8th rank, my rook will go to the back rank and go to H8 and win this H7 pawn, which is a pawn you certainly cannot afford. To lose so that might be a strategy for black honestly is trying to give up one of these pawns and in return putting your rooks in like the third rank to get the g3 pawn so that that is really black's winning chance is coming after g3 i'm just wow look at andraken um vladimirovich against bakro okay. baki 83. let's go right there whoa we just had a fake queen sack a fake queen sack a fake queen sack oh nice work so going right into the fork, but at the end of it, it looks like black is trading off. So bishop takes d5 here, forces an exchange of the rooks. But how many pawns is white yeah. up? Four? He's got four of them. <laughs> yeah. But this rookie two move is definitely a good start for black to recover. Oh, that was the only move to keep this a game, huh? Yeah, but this h-pawn. Gotta keep the white king out. This h-pawn is, is really Roman. Now you want to bring your king to e5, I guess, for black? So just rush that king because from e5, it will also be able to be in time to cover the h8 queening square. Yeah. So here comes king e5, presumably. Oh, takes uh -oh. time out for the b pawn. Okay, who's stopping the h pawn now? I guess if h6, the point is the rook will come to e back to e2 and try to head back towards e8. And it's, you know, that pawn could have advanced a little too far. That's always the concern when you put that pawn in a dark square. Especially so I mean, far once away. it gets to h7, white's got the idea of, you know, bishop c2 and g4 and bishop f5. Yeah, that, and then, and then that's, that looks like a good way to keep black frozen. But if I take on, oh, if you take on d5 now, then bishop b3 check, right? Yeah. That, that was the point. So rook h8 is a nice move first because now white is going to have a hard time defending this pawn on d5. And mm -hmm. if I take d5, then my king will run to g7 and then I'll swing my rook over to the queen side and hold down that side of the board so it looks like yeah so now i don't know if black can defend it actually i i i, I would have wanted to run my king to the age pawn but that was sort of a random instinct well um, can black still go king e6 king f6 king g7 now and yeah that... yeah maybe he could and free the rook oh but if king e6 maybe g5 is a potential option just to keep your king away and then i would play f5 for black probably Oh, no, it doesn't quite work. G6, king f6, bishop takes f5. Yeah, that's exactly what I was hoping would happen. And then my, <laughs> That's what you wanted. Then my pawns would be advancing too quickly. But in this game, it looks like the king went to e5, stopping g5, because the king would go to f4. And so king e3. We have a standoff in the center. Opposition, but rook a8 already swinging to the, the queen side. Note that the pawn a2 is not <laughs> under attack, because then uh, white will get a queen. So g5 here is still an option. Duda, Duda has won his first pro chess league game. Oh, he won that game? I yeah. mean, I'm not surprised he because he's Duda. He slowly got on top. I never thought that you needed to see it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fair. Oh, speaking of needing to see the Van Whaley game, it looks like Loke Van Whaley has made progress. We'll go there really quickly and try to come back to this. Yeah, he set up the mate thread on H5, the one thing that I was thinking of. Yep. 
He went his bo yeah. one rook, both rooks to the uh, third rank, and then he put a second rook on g3, threatening rook h5 <coughs> major as the g pawn was pinned to the king. And some desperation by Andreasen. He's going to take this rook on g3, but then black will take the rook, and then the g4 pawn will also fall, and then probably the f6 pawn, and then also maybe the h6 pawn. So Andreasen smartly, well, where's that king going? I thought his king would go to h5 to try and hope for some kind of a stalemate trick, but no. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been really clever. And, okay, the king is trying to get to d6, I guess, but as soon as you go there, you can't move your rook away from the d5 because then rook d4 check will come. So I feel like technically this should be winning somehow, but I don't know how. And maybe rook e4 check, king d6, and then play f4. And that way, if you're, you, know, you move your rook away from d2, I'll always have rook d4 check kicking your king away. So that's a, a definitely a viable option for black here. Um, okay, rook a4, so that way you can go rook a5 check. But now, a move like rook g2. g2, you're thinking? But then king d7, that's sort of the point. Is I'm trying to checkmate this king Right, d5. rook g7, rook. rook but e4, whenever yeah. the king's on d7, then you have to watch out for my stalemate tricks again, right? So now I want to go like... Or rook d2, king c7, rook d7 check. Oh, right? that's rook d7 Don't check I? is so nice. Oh, he didn't do it. He missed it. Rook d7 was brilliant. That way to draw on the spot. But look at this king go. This king uh -oh. is going to e7. So rook a7. No, but rook a7, there might be some rook b2 check, forcing your king over to the a file. So all of a sudden, Andreasen is getting, he's getting cheeky over here. It looks like he has to play rook a7, no? I guess he could wait for the king to be there and then play rook a7 with check, but, but that the king, white king will even go to g7, exactly. right? Exactly. Here comes the king. Okay, he's pushing the king to the a file. King e7. We don't know who's going to win, do we? I think is black is still <laughs> a touch ahead because the e pawn is rolling. e5. Just start. Oh, no, but king e6, king e5. You get out of it. King e6 now. No, that's the wrong way. You can't go that uh -uh. way. e3. No, but yeah. black's just going first. So yeah. this is He's an amazing He's going to sack his rook ending. for the F pawn now and then win with the two pawns. Although white, yeah, I guess black's not in time to win H7. So E2 here and F either queen. But yeah, this is winning now. Okay, David. Wow, he's almost got, he's almost got the H pawn draw, but no. <laughs> David, make sure you put a mental note or, because I know you do these amazing uh, highlight, um, you know, the video lessons for the Pro Chess League. Yeah. Oh, black missed a maiden two. Did he? <laughs> Oh, yeah, he did. You just go queen f7, check, king h8 like he did, then move your king, and white has to play h7. Exactly, then you made the next move. So we can show that as soon as this... Okay, re resignation. Yeah, whatever. Let's go to instant <laughs> replay there. So after king h8, as David said, you move your king. h7 is the only legal move. Queen f8 is checkmate. But uh, you should keep this game in mind, David, because you do... I'm going to pull up... I have the template somewhere for... There it is. I am David Pruis, Pro Chess Lessons. You can watch David's amazing videos that go up on YouTube. And so I, I was saying, David, I think you should make a note about this game. Because <laughs> to go back and look at this. It happened so fast there. It was hard to even know, like, who was winning or losing or how many times it may have swung. I don't know. It, it, just, it was too fast It just me. feels like a great stalemate tactic that everyone should learn. Right? And actually, we should – I'm gonna, because all the games are over – I'm going to go right back there. David, you spotted that a mile away, so that was really cool. Rook, I move 66, black went king c7, and I move 67, white should have played rook d7 check. And the point is this king on e5 has no legal squares, so that if I take on d7, it's immediately stalemate. King can't move anywhere. The pawns are stuck. And perhaps after rook d7 check, the king was going up to c6. But then your idea, again, rook c7 check comes in, and still with a stalemate technique. This is pretty yeah. brilliant stuff. Well, I don't know, like for a while I had on my mind that the only way for black to win was to set up a mating net, right? Yeah. But the flip side of setting up a mating net in an end game is that your opponent's chance is to get a stalemate, so. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's just, just what I was looking for. Th these are things you don't really think about, right? But all of a sudden, you know, you have instructor here, very instructional David Pruis. Just reminding us that a checkmate has its flaws. And Peter Leko <laughs> said at White Gonzay, he goes, I don't believe in mating attacks. <laughs> That's literally a direct quote. So Okay. He's like, That's a good one. He's like, when the mate appears on the board, then I believe it. And I, this is actually a great example of that. It looks like <laughs> the king is ensnared by you know, have, Black's pawns. He must, 
he must have had a nasty surprise once or twice in his life if that's his attitude. <laughs> I don't believe it. I don't believe it. there's like six pieces in front of his king. I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, this is just this is an illusion. Definitely not happening right now. All right, Polish fighter is back. He's taking on Etienne Bakro. Oh, we have Vidit Chess against Andrekin. We're spoiled right now, is what I'm yeah. what I'm seeing here. Yeah, you got some choices there. So wait, Polish fighter has not moved, which means okay. he's probably away from the board. But yeah. we'll wait for him to make some moves. Not hey, Robert, what would you do during those two minutes between rounds if you were a player? I would... I don't know. That's a very good... You seem like somebody who might run to the bathroom. I don't know. I, actually, would I play? And just in general, like I can sit for very long periods of time and not have to go to the bathroom. You know, okay. Too much information, likely. I'm but, wrong, then. You know, everyone <laughs> has here probably seen me do commentary before. I just never right. have to go. And so I think right. that um, I would just... Probably talk to my teammates, see how they're feeling, because yeah. it is a team event after all, and you want to make sure everybody is happy. So I, I did bring yeah. up the standings, and it, all there's three wins or one win. There was no in between. My my team like most of them like to talk to each other, but I had one guy who was like preparing frantically between games every time he had like two, three, four minutes. He that, would like start looking through some more of his opponent, his next opponent's games. He had them all like queued up and waiting. <laughs> That's kind of awesome and also just extremely hilarious. Yeah, I was like, the the effort to pay off, right? Is like, I mean, from my tournament days, you would never like try that hard to prepare when you had that little time. Absolutely. Also, I uh, was going to say Vidit. Duda has not moved yet, so hopefully he doesn't just lose on time here. I hope, Oof, you know, yeah. It is his debut in the Pro Chess League. He is not in France, as far as I'm aware, but he's playing for Khan, so... Hopefully his teammates can get in touch with him. But let's go to a game that actually has moves. There are yeah, I mean, his teammates are moving, so they. The, the rest of the team knows that it's on. Ooh, I see a, an interesting game here between Shant Sargisyan and mm -hmm. regular legs. That is Marco Baldoff. Got it. It's a pawn structure you don't see every day. No, indeed not. It's... Black's not even up a pawn. I thought Black was up a pawn for a second because I'm very right. worried about the life of the C4 pawn. Often when you see a pawn on C4, you figure it's your extra pawn. <laughs> exactly. Right. You figure Black went D takes C4 at some point to take a pawn, but then you realize, wait a second, White's C pawn is still alive on C5, and that B pawn is still alive on C3. So, okay, Black can always try something with Queen to A5, but the real concern right. I have is if White goes for like a Bishop F3, pawn D5 push, yeah, I'm, starting to feel I'm really almost nervous. certain black will play bishop d5 if you play bishop f3 at some point. I don't think black could, like, tolerate giving up that diagonal. Well, this is exactly... The stare down has, has been initiated here. Yeah. And if you... That, why would love for black to take on f3? Because the p whole yeah. point of this position is this pawn push to d5 will be phenomenal for white because you're getting your pawns yep. rolling, the b7 pawn is hanging, and very importantly, black has no time to play b6, because when white plays c6, that's an advanced pass pawn with the bishop and, on um, to support it. The flip side, everybody, is that black would love for white to take on d5. Then he gets this queen on d5, sort of unchallenged, blockading, controlling all these diagonals. So, I mean, I've, I've covered this like 50 times in 50 different lessons, but anytime there's like a bishop trade, you want to be the person who is left with your queen controlling the diagonals of the bishops that were traded. Absolutely. And that's why rookie one is one of those moves trying to do exactly that, because now I'm threatening bishop takes d5 where e7 is hanging at the end. And if you play e6, yeah. anytime you make a pawn move, you leave a weak square next to that pawn. So if e6 was played, then the bishop would have come right <coughs> to the d6 square. So rookie eight is one of those... Uh, better safe than sorry moves. Yeah. For those who don't know, Shant is like, he's like basically a third board all-star so far this season, right? I mean, he's one of the top performers here for the Armenia Eagles. He plays board three almost every match, and he scores more than two points almost every match, which is pretty good for board three. Yeah, and he, they're also, they you usually try out lineups where they have a pretty high rated board three, in this case, Shant Sargisyan, because 2477, mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty good, but at the same time here, we see Marco Baldoff similarly rated and not having the same success that Sargissian is. So very nice to have a young international master who is punching above his weight. Yeah. Um, let's see. So Sargissian's performance rating is 2,600, well, 2,596. So, you know, that's 
2470 is high rated for this board, but he's still performing well above that. Get that man to GM norm. Can we, yeah. is Fide watching? Are you here? Can we can we get that piece of paper? Can we get norms in the <laughs> protest league? <laughs> you know, it seems like it seems like at some point there will be like rapid and blitz norms and rapid and blitz GMs because there is yeah a different that makes sense. That's that's a skill set, but people obviously thrive in different time controls. So, it, but if they're maintaining a separate rating list and having separate tournaments at some point, it could make sense as they have more and more tournaments that seem to be tending towards rapid. Yeah, absolutely. Also, this is going to be totally off topic, but I do think that players should have different ratings when they're white and when they're black. I definitely do not think that the summation of like one rating is is at all accurate because if you draw Magnus Carlsen with black, you should get more rating points than drawing him with white, especially in this computer age where there's some like forced, you know, forced draws in many lines or black has to make some really bad decision. So it's easier, just statistically easier to draw with white. The rating, these are, you know, it's mathematical numbers or formulas involved. So I definitely believe that we should have different ratings for white and black. But Whoa, that totally makes sense. But I've never heard that before, Robert. And I thought I'd heard every wacky <laughs> chess idea out there. Yeah, so I'm going to, before I go off on a total rant, let's go <laughs> either to, to look at how Sean Sargisian is doing here. Uh, it looks like he's doing okay for the moment with the black pieces or find some other game that can... To keep my attention sure. away from how about, the problem. How about Oparin versus Ganguly? It's actually very funny. I just scrolled over that. So here we go. Queen on e3, bishop on b7. What is going on here? I was going to say it's white up a pawn, but no, the material is equal. Nope. The material is still equal, but there's some, there's some weird possibilities coming. <clears throat> yeah. You would imagine that this rook on a8 is going to move next and then you have to calculate bishop b2 wherever wherever that rook goes right because that puts obviously an immediate attack of the d4 rook but very importantly if we can trade bishops my undeveloped bishop on c1 for this well actually rook a2 here might be a but rook a2 perhaps doesn't even stop bishop b2 so it's, right. it's one of those moves mm. like oh i'm attacking the e2 pawn i'm trying to stop bishop b2 but then you realize maybe bishop b2 is still a good move just trading off the bishops in the long diagonal and that, the danger for black with the trade is queen c3 check at the end. Exactly. So let's say this rook, well, also this rook might get trapped, but rook g4 as the only safe score I see. Then I take okay. on g7, and I can probably kick this rook, and then queen c3 check. With comes. h3. Yeah, bishop f3, h3. Or bishop f3, moves. you did, sure. Yeah. And then, and then it's like hard to say what, um, how, how that works out for black, huh? Looks pretty terrible. I think yeah. Almost universally, having your rook on g5 in a position like that is not going to be a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, as black here, I would be willing to have something wrong with my position as long as I don't lose material. Yeah. Because, I mean, like, when it's, you know, that bad a threat, then you're like, hey, if I can get out with my pieces in any shape at all, maybe, I will take that. Maybe bishop d5 is an option here, just to... Give mm -hmm. up the rook on a8, saying that this open diagonal will be useful. Okay, rook a4 played, which is an interesting way of sort of... De it defends the bishop on c4. That's the good thing. defends news. the bishop on c4. That, that must be the main point. But where's this rook going? I mean, the rook on uh, d4, if that's going to head over to g4, you're still going to yeah. be left with a rook maybe on g5, or after rook g4, I take on g7, you take back, okay. and I play f4, and then your rook is just trapped on g4. It's just trapped after f4. That's a good move. That's a good move. Oh, he's just given it. He has just given it. I kind of like that. As a, you know, the other the other alternatives are just immediately losing for Black. It seems so. Ganguly, a very experienced player. He's been a second for uh, Vichy Anand, so world champion. Yeah. He he knows what he's doing. But this looks still looks very good for White. Up in exchange here for just one pawn, and it's not enough compensation as. The rooks are going to have some open files to work, especially this B file. I would try to trade the light square bishops and then just roll down the B file. That's sort of my yep. intention here. I would also like to trade the light squared bishops. Rook takes B5 as an option now. Rook B5, queen B5, bishop C6. Yeah. That looks foolproof. That's a short enough combination that nothing can be, can be going wrong and, there. And then if you go queen A5, I might even play bishop E8 to hit the F7 pawn. And before mm -hmm. taking back on a4, I just feel like you know the attack is coming so quickly that if you have to touch this f pawn, then any resulting end game where you have bishop and pawn for rook, it's going to be uh, a dangerous situation with your king exposed. So yeah, rook takes b5 is nice a move I play immediately. Okay, very good. Um, 
Oparin's thinking about it. He's got twice as much time as Surya, so he can he can afford to think now and then. But uh, I mean, trading light squared bishops is so clearly what you want to do. I can't imagine you wouldn't play rook b5. I mean, trading a rook helps too. I mean, yes, yeah. it's, it's all good for white. Yeah, and especially if you could throw in this bishop e8 move, which I believe black can't stop then you're forcing that f pawn to move, in which case the king is vulnerable. And that's what you really need when you have this imbalance of rook against bishop. You know, rook is better than bishop, but there's also a pawn. And if you have no uh, targets to exploit, black may be able to set up a position where there's no progress can easily be made for white. So that's why a move like bishop e8 in that line was very useful. Uh, All right, new tie four, white against Paul Velton. Okay, uh, I found that game. Whoa. Board two for the migraines versus board two for the blitz stream, I think. Or are they board three? Yeah, that, that, that's uh, board two or board three. I can easily find this out by just pulling up this It's tab. board two. Board it two. is board two. Yep. So um, there's a knight trying to live on F7. What's up with that? Yeah, because that pawn was, oh. was hanging because <laughs> the end of variations, there was a knight hanging on B8. This is not a good way right. to develop. Knight on b8 and a8, not ideal for everyone So watching. that's how he got into f7. If black took the knights, he'd grab on b8. Yeah, this would now just... he's running away with his extra pawn. Greedy man. Greedy man, but also smart man. Um, I mean, the other knight still needs to get out too from, from d6, right? That's true. Well, now rook takes f4. Whoa, now his knight came into e6 but, too. But rook takes f4, right? You just win the yeah, knight rook on d6? Yeah, rook takes f4. Seems logical. I guess there's a problem for black is after rook, queen d6... Knight of four, oh, sorry, not queen six. Rook f four first, <laughs> wrong move order. Yeah, uh, sure. Knight f four, queen d six, and rook d seven. Perhaps I can just follow that up with some sort of initiative quickly. But I, I mean, rook f four played by Paul Velton. Yeah, yeah, logical, logical to take the material that's hanging. Okay, start with rook e eight check, just to put that king on f seven. So rook e eight okay. check here, mm -hmm. and if king f seven, then I bring my rook back to e six. And then maybe I have some discoveries on queen f3 at some point. But the knight doesn't feel like it's enough for white. That's the real problem. Like, do I play queen a1 yeah, no, here? It's... Actually, queen a1 is a, a sort of a frisky move, just coming up to the a6 square. Yeah. Very double-edged position, because I think that black should be happy with what's transpired in the last few moves, yeah. especially with this knight coming to d4. The move I want to play for black if I can is knight to d4, but yeah. all right, so far I haven't had time. Yeah, and, <coughs> and the knight on b6 is hanging there as well, but if you know you make a silly move like queen e1, then knight d4 comes in very powerfully. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now knight c8 is probably a good move, just rerouting these pieces. Yeah. I mean, I was wondering to myself if h4 needed to be played because g5 was potentially a threat. Ah, so bishop e5 might also be a good move for black. Yeah. Just trying to get at this yeah. knight. He's done the whole trade off the piece on f4 thing already once, so why not do it twice? Yeah. So if we're down to queen g4. Well, then I think black you might. Play bishop f4, yep. gf4, knight to d8. Exactly. Because the queen on d7 is defended against the rook g6 check tactic. We had the same exact thought process there. I was about to say the same thing. You beat me to it. Yeah. But very importantly, the knight protects the queen because normally you'd have discoveries, right? If you, this rook moves out the way, our queens are attacking each other. So rook takes g6 check, but as mentioned, the knight actually protects it. And this still, um, you know, is something that black have to keep an eye on, but I really like how Velton has handled this. So I, I'm liking black's chances in this one, even though I hated black's position at first. Wait, also, can we go over to the... Oh, it, the game just ended, so never mind. Ugh. I was going to go over to a game that finished yeah, yeah. as soon as I brought it up so where do we go from here how about indian lad versus joppy too because that's oh yeah jordan van forest versus uh narayanan and narayanan has been good in the pro chess league and yeah i'm just worried because this a pawn is rolling and it looks this like black is trying to give a checkmate but the rook on c1 is just always covering so maybe Ben Forrest right. is lost. And you've been hanging out with Peter Leko, so you're like, Black's not going to checkmate. Exactly. You know, I, I, don't, I don't believe in checkmates. I don't believe in checkmates, and checkmates in an endgame? Come on. I mean, how could there be? And can I just start... Okay, the E2 pawn is hanging. Maybe I want to keep that one. So Bishop D3 
is certainly an option. I guess if you can I do something else. Yeah, bishop takes e2 could be annoying because it also controls a6. Exactly. So, but what about rook c6 here? If we trade rooks and then bishop e2, white could play king f2, right? Yeah, I thought so. I guess here bishop e2, rook e1 is the intention. But then you can't even take the oh, bishop so on e2, right? So bishop. You're not even trying to take it. Yeah, because you can't take this with rook f1 being a mating idea. But I assume white can make another use from like h3 or h4 and then try to take it. So. Oh, I was just wondering if white could go knight f7 check after bishop e2 to go for rook c8 mate. But oh. on knight f7, king to g8. But then you could take e5 and that and looks... Then you put the knight on e5 maybe. They're both getting... <laughs> They're both sort of... Yeah, and then it's still you're renewing that threat of rook c8 yeah. mate. So that looks pretty good. That, that looks like a very interesting attempt, honestly. Yeah, because the knight on d8 is not that well placed. So that's probably all in all a fair try for white. Yep. And those the pawns are rolling, right? That's really... What we're seeing here is that at some point we need to start playing eight for a6, you know, b5, and all that. So knight f7 check Ooh. played. Played it instantly. And knight takes e5. There it is. So all right. Renewing so no, the threat. no surprise to a 2600. <laughs> no, Narayanan is, he's also up two pawns here. So he's going to win this. I think we feel pretty confident saying that. Unless he get blunders checkmate, in which case we'll look at the aftermath. But mm -hmm. this looks completely winning for. In which None. case, you'll have to run back to Leko and be like, but you told me that. <laughs> you told me mate didn't exist, but here it is. So Paul Velton won that game, by the way, very quickly, okay. just to pull up the, yeah. the finale. He won by resignation because after bishop e5, white went queen e1, and then knight d4 came hitting the rook. Then he got to play the exact move that you told us about, yep. knight d4. So that was... Never it. play queen e1 <laughs> when the opponent has knight d4. That's... A Probably an accurate statement. Just never do it. Um, All right. What else we have? Christoph Duda looks like he's in trouble to me. Okay. Against. Um, he's up a pawn. He's up a pawn. So if I'm right that his position's bad, then it was probably a brilliant pawn sacrifice by Mr. Bacro. Yeah. It's one of those fake extra pawn positions. It's at least how I like to think of it. Because, sure, by material count, white is up a pawn. But the bishops are just so strong in positions like this. Your knight on a4 and knight on d1 are not really collaborating very well. Queen C4. Oh, but Crow's been down a pawn forever. The first time I looked at this position, I didn't even realize he was down a pawn, but he's been down the whole time. He just didn't care. He said, you know, my, my yeah. position's too excellent. So Queen C4 played. That worries me because if a queen trade happens, this A pawn seems to be rolling. So like if I take on C4, you take back up at Bishop C6, then A5, mm -hmm. then A4, then A3. I think you get the point where that pawn's going. Okay. That feels like an option, but perhaps Duda's hoping like some knight c3 at the end there and just sitting tight on the position will allow him to liquidate into a more manageable endgame. I think that's true. So maybe just queen d2 or queen, queen, yeah, queen d2 or queen e1 check first and then queen d2. Right. Feels yeah, good. I'd be inclined to play queen e1 check, queen f1, and then queen d2. Oh, well, I, I guess not yeah. since this forced <laughs> the queen to f1 anyway. That would have been a terrible idea. Yeah. So what, what now? Bishop d5? Bishop, bishop h4? <laughs> so many good-looking moves here. I'm trying to play bishop a6. Just oh, fair you're warning. devious. Well, I like to be honest about my intentions. <laughs> you're so devious. That is nice. You're, you're going all for the endgame checkmating attacks. This is your the theme of the day for you. You found this stalemate yeah. in that earlier game. Now you're trying to deliver some kind of checkmate here in the last game we and, looked at. So... Yeah, this looks terrible for Duda. I think starting off down two or three minutes on the clock or however many, how much time he spent away from the board did not help his chances against a strong player like Buckrow. And mm -hmm. I think bishop d5, okay, queen c2, some move coming after the b3 pawn. Yeah, cleaning up the b pawn is pretty pleasant. But this was a really nice move, knight f2. Because if you take on b3, then white has this knight c5 move, and all of a sudden you're losing one of your two bishops, and that makes, I feel like, White chance a little bit better, but then the A pawn is pa okay. It's just really terrible position. I, I'm speaking and then I'm regretting that I opened my mouth to <laughs> defend White's position. You're like, well, Black can afford to trade one bishop at this point if he's got his pawn back and he's got the A pawn. Yeah, this is so bad. Like, but he hangs on to it. So now, if Bishop takes E4, F takes E4, Queen B3, White suddenly has Queen F6 by surprise. Right, that Queen has opened up. 
Um, so yeah, let's put let's put this bishop in here uh, on this, e3. That's where I wanted it all along. This is so gross. This pawn structure is bad. The knight a4 is not doing anything. Um, the e3 pawn is not going to be able to be protected. B3 is about to fall down as well, and that actually will, like win the knight a4. So this is losing for Duda at this point. I find I find Bakro's moves so far to be pretty incisive. Like every one he plays, I'm like, yeah, that seems like it was probably the right way to do this. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> and the best thing you can do is like try and distract him from the E pawn with the H pawn. Like, oh, maybe you want this toy instead. <laughs> and there's a great comment as well that uh, by aspect, no, by excuse me, Mr. Dodgy Chess, Bakro okay. is so wasteful. Never once uses that T in his name. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the French language in general has like so many like wasted letters. That's definitely a thing. Well, so does English, right? Because if you think about the word night, no matter if you're spelling with the yeah. K or like nighttime, the GHT yeah. at the end doesn't exactly feel very useful. Yeah, all our all our words with the GHs are kind of wasted. We should all we should all say knicht and stuff like that if we wanted to. I agree with you. A little better. Bishop F4 must be the move now, right? Just ending, yeah. ending, end, ending. Bishop F4 should... My mate thing just went on. I guess Bishop F4 G3 is the saving grace. Oh. I like Bishop D4. <laughs> Bishop D4. So Bishop D4 is better just shouldering him out. Kind of like. <laughs> yeah. That way you just keep the queen on C... Yeah, Bishop D4 played. Okay, I'll trade queens once your knight is trapped and I've taken at least one more pawn on the king side. Yeah, you might get mated first, queen e3, just absolutely, look at this, it keeps that knight stuck oh, here. Yeah, we can. this is pretty brutal. Are any... It's nice how this bishop stops everything. It stops the knight from moving and it stops perpetuals against his own king. That's perfect with the f7, g6 structure. And now a queen e6 h5. check, queen trade is winning on the spot because that, well, maybe not on the spot, but that knight... But just mate him, play h5. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like getting technical here. Like the knight is trapped on a4, so we could play queen e6 to make a trade, and I'm up a pawn. But yeah, just go for yeah. checkmate. Just check queen e2 check. Just checkmate him. Bishop g1 now. Oh, that's. Can he? Yes, he can. And queen g2, queen e6. Oh yeah, queen g4 was mate in that. Okay, <laughs> look at this. He just he, he's getting technical on us. Did he not have mate? He, or he had mate probably, but yeah, okay. it's just so winning because this knight is trapped over here. That Bakro decided to play like this. Yeah, that's not a good night. Uh, where else are we? Okay, I see some end games. It looks like Vinny the Pooh. So just to go over there for a second. Vinny the Pooh is Aditya Mittal with the black pieces. Is a completely winning pawn end game as this king will go to the C file and win the B2 pawn. We can get off that one very quickly. Okay. Uh, um, that's a good. Good pop back from him after his last round game against the 2000, who was actually 2400. Yeah, that's a, you know, false, fake advertising. And yeah. Hushinbeth against Zavin Andreasin. I see Andreasin is up a knight, but his king does not feel very safe here. And Oh, wow, this is thrilling. Hushinbeth has six seconds left, so do not lose on time. The Berlin Bears will... Whoa, sacked? He sacked his rook. Yeah, and I guess they're... The hope is just to make a draw here, and it looks like the king can't really escape, and it's going to be a draw. So if you try to run up the board, let's say... With yeah, if king, you go to g4. Then it feels like some queen d1 check, king g5 to keep the rook protected, then queen d2 check, and we're just going to have a, a nice little check Just keep party. checking him. Wow. Yeah. Well, a well-used couple seconds there by black to get out of it before <laughs> things got any worse. Yep, that's, it's actually a good lesson, right? You're up material, but your king is in trouble. Sometimes you just need to bail out. You just got to yeah. make sure you're not going to lose the game. And what else do we have? We've hit a rook end game between regular legs and Sean Sargissian. So Sargissian is up one pawn in this rook and pawn versus rook ending. And yeah. Okay, the king is cut off. That's the good news for black. And now it looks like yeah. the rook went to and, the long side, which was smart. And white's got 10 seconds. Yep. But this rook a8, rook a3 check, you know, coming to the long side is usually the right plan here. Because you don't want you don't want the rook on the short side. So let's imagine this king yeah. was on d2 rather than the h file, and the rook here would... rookie one t2 is winning though. Oh, well, now it's like winning. Like normally for sure. you do want to then go to the second rank, but yep. And here comes the f pawn. King e3. Yeah. F4. Wow. Don't mess with chance. King f3 resigns. Because when, um, my king will go the other way, wherever your king doesn't go. So chant. 
is in it to it seemed win. like it seemed like white was doing the right thing i mean with 10 seconds those are exactly the moves i would play i'd go like rook a a3 a2 try and stay on those far away squares yeah. but there's a lot of tricks actually oh for sure and unfortunately for him he, he ran right into the rook trade which lost him the game so two games left that i see uh, oparin versus ganguli whoa yeah. this game and that that's a game we want to see yeah and if you, we look at the position here, black has a pawn and bishop still for the rook, but both kings are vulnerable, and both sides have less than seven yeah. seconds. Uh, yeah, somebody's going to get mated or stalemated. Well, More likely mated. He didn't throw a rook a6 check in. He took on h5 right away. That seems like a bad decision because I thought mm -hmm. rook a6 check was a useful inclusion. Instead, the king is going to get checked for maybe ever. C2, Who if knows? you take queen e4 check, so throw, nice, nice. Yeah, but this covers it. Can't he grab it now? Yeah, now it's... Can, then it's over. Queen f3 check. Okay. I was thinking queen d7 to d2, but this will do it. Uh, queen d7 d2 was even stronger, probably. Objectively, that was probably a better decision, but... Just taking the queens off is best when you've got 10 seconds and yeah. you're winning, I guess. <laughs> <sighs> One last game. Wait, the game... Wow. Radek Sadwani won on time. Froljanov lost on time. I just tuned into this position. Okay, it was losing for black anyway, but... White's got queen f6 check if black takes the pawn. Yeah, right? queen f6, forcing the queens off. Another time forcing material off is very good to trade into a winning king and pawn end game. So well, that's that's a little bit of an upset. Froljanov at 2530 is like one of the highest board threes, if not the highest board three. Um in uh in this board three version of the Battle Royale tournament. <laughs> yeah, that is each, each board is its own tournament, right? Yep. Exactly, because you only play the players in your board. But Raunik Sidwani is very young, and he's one of those young Indian talents. He played Vishy <coughs> Anand in the first round of the Isle of Man tournament. In fact, he was beating Vishy. And, oh, wow. Uh, Vishy escaped. It was like plus two or plus three in engine talk for Sidwani, and Vishy managed to, you know, Vishy him. Just experience yeah. won the day. But Sidwani is a name that the chess world at large should definitely keep an eye on. Okay. Well, Froljanov knows about him now. <laughs> he knows all about him. He, he's, yeah. he got a donut against him. But I'm looking at the standings here, and Mumbai just across the board, right? Their board for Aditya Matal lost to this very underrated Manu David Suthandram, and then rebounded mm -hmm. and won the second game. Sadwani's won both games. Ganguly, one out of two, uh, just lost the game we, against Oparin. There's no shame there. And yeah. Vidit, one and a half out of two. That's a pretty good start considering the high-powered board ones in this league. So I, I like Mumbai just kind of keeping it even across the board here. And they're in first place. And Delhi Dynamite, they, they, the Indian teams matched up in the first round of this matchup, but they're going to be led by their board four, right? Manu David Suthandrum, if he goes, does not go seven out of seven, I think there might be a little bit of upset in, in Delhi because, you know, he's, he's there because he's 2,400 in a 2,000 rating. Right. Yeah, well, he started. He started right. He started right. Yep. Wow. Has he played in previous weeks, or this, or is he like a, a new pickup? In this week. Uh, good question. I have I the. It's a good question. Greg. Greg will probably answer in the chat yeah, for us. Yeah, I have the uh, the the website up. So, so he... that's slightly beyond my knowledge of every single player in every single division. Wait, I don't even see his name on their player list. So he's okay, like, then he's new. He must be a new addition. <laughs> and a very this week, there were a bunch of new additions who I couldn't find in the player list. And I was like, okay, well, yeah. they're still recruiting. Still recruiting. Yeah. This you, is... know which, you know which championship team has room to recruit a lot more players if needed? Which team? The, the Eagles. Really? They've got like eight open roster spots or something out of 16. That's... Like they're in, they're in first place and, you know, they've used half as many players. I just there, you know, they stick to their their weapons that won them the championship last year, and they have a very local feel. They're right, all Armenians except their free agent, who happens to be <coughs> kind of good at chess, Parham Maksudlu. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, but we we could tell that vibe was really palpable at the uh, finals last year. Like they were such good friends, oh, the camaraderie yeah. was real. They are missing some players from that championship winning team, like Karin yep. Gregorian is not on the team this year, but I guess, you know, either he was busy or had something else to do, or they'll add him later in the year being like, hey, don't forget about, don't, don't forget about me. I helped win a championship. So, yeah, they're, they're definitely 
a very, very strong team, of course. But it's interesting because they're not rated that highly. Like when I look at board one, I'm looking for the Dudas and the Vidits, but having Zavin on board one feels like it should be a huge disadvantage, but it works out for them. Zavin's good. He's a former world junior player, talented. And, I mean, not player, champion, right? Um, talented and, and good in, in rapid time controls. So it's a solid choice for a board one. Yeah, no, he's, he's clearly good. And Artak Manukyan, their manager, is pretty trusty uh, for the Armada Eagles on board four. He's, he outperformed his rating by a large margin last year. And here the action is once again underway. And I see Zavin yeah. against Duda, so that's my... Oh, this is a Petrov. Never mind. <laughs> I was, I was going to say, oh, that's a game I want to look at. Then I saw yeah. the Petrov. But yeah. to the credit of this version of the Petrov, this is okay. a more fighting variation, I feel like, because... Okay, nope, never mind. Everything I wanted to say, they've, mm -hmm. they've changed my mind very quickly. Oh, two bishops for white. Black is very yeah. solid. Double pawns for white, which is usually a disadvantage, but in these positions... You, you sound like you don't even want to finish saying all the factors in this position. You just want to click on another game. Yeah, but for the fans, <laughs> right? It's, it's always for okay. the fans. <laughs> it is an interesting dynamic. So to give the position its you know fair, fair due here, like the pawn goes to c4 for white often, and it makes black's life much more difficult to play d5. Now, black often doesn't want to play d5, because the one bishop that black is missing is a dark square bishop. And by pushing yeah. your pawn from a dark square to light square, you open up new avenues for this bishop on f2 and for p potential infiltration. So, yeah, looks like yeah. white is going to try g4 and some expansion. Black is going to sit tight and retreat the bishop to g6. Maybe white will then decide, do I want to play for f4 and expand the king side? But now I'm done looking at this game. Unless you want to All say right. anything about it, I'm totally... No, no, no. I, I want to oh. see the game of our tech yeah i agree i just saw that <laughs> you're meeting eagle he went g5 on move manager three. and total g that is awesome g5. g5 is one of those moves that you tell your students never play like this but when you see a more experienced player you're like all right this is going to be fun and yeah the response f3 is played so that instead of playing bishop to g3 which later at some point not immediately black can take on g3 you'll wait for the right moment perhaps when you're under attack Instead, after f3, you're sort of forcing the issue because you can't just move your knight back or you lose a pawn for free on g5. And if you yeah. take on h4, who has gotten the better yeah. double pawns? These ugly double pawns? Now black should play bishop to h6. Yeah. Coming from right. e2 he, he knew it. He, he, knew, he knew what he was up to. Yeah. And it, that's the thing, right? The trade-off is your <laughs> ugly double pawns on the h file versus total control over the dark squares. And right now, the dark squares aren't, like, you know, it's not devastating for white, but you can clearly imagine if um, the game continues in this way and something lands on e3, whether it's a bishop, a queen, or this knight going through f6, perhaps, to g4, then, uh -huh. then white will be in big trouble. But for now, I love white's position. I love the strong center. Knight takes h4, of course, is going to be hanging at either next move or in the near future. Yeah. I'm digging it. You can have the h4 pawn. This position is, is, is balanced. I, I, I've played this as black. Um, and uh, the dark square control is worth it. It's, uh, it's an unusual position, obviously, but uh, plenty of fun to play. Yeah, I completely agree. And it, it just makes an imbalance from the very early stage of the game. And it, in rapid chess, you look at black's time, actually. It's what, what's interesting is black was yeah. the one with the sort of offbeat opening choice against right. an offbeat opening, and now it is down two minutes on the clock. So that doesn't inspire much confidence to me, especially now that you've gotten rid of one of your double pawns, and then the knight will come to c3 with tempo. I'll play e4, and white will have a very, very big center. But I'm not... I should... Also, I'm pretty sure that d5 is the wrong move as well. Yeah, that, so, that does... I mean, it's his opening, and he thought for two minutes and then played the wrong move, so... Yeah. By the way, Duda and Zavin Andreas had made a very nice Grandmaster draw, so I'm glad we did not stick that. <laughs> Good thing we didn't see the end of that. Yeah, this is seeing the beginning was already too much. Yeah, I, I regret it. I'm actually struggling with this. I'm, I'm a little traumatized. And also, yeah. I got to give a shout out to all 3,800 people who are tuning in right now to the Pro Chess League. It's the Battle Royale. Just to throw up that graphic very quickly here, what the Battle Royale format is. It's board one plays board one, board two plays board two, board three versus three, four versus four. It's not the usual. Um, 
one team plays another, and you play everyone from that team. So it's a different format this week. And um, just to give everyone the standings, the Mumbai movers at the top, the Armenian Eagles yeah. in a close second. But there's still so much action. Seven rounds of chess. We've only played two thus far. We're in the middle of round three. Yeah. It's, it's nonstop. Um, so, I, I mean, this game's going to be super fun. Um, I think, let's see. I think a piece is just dropped in the Mikatarian game versus Paul Velton because Knight to C. I was just clicking on that. Yeah, Knight to C. I saw this pawn on D6 and thought, huh, that's probably. Knight C4 was played, but can I just go Bishop takes in D7? Like, can I. Uh, probably. Isn't that just. My rook on D1 is protected. That D pawn's looking pretty good. So, like, I don't have to worry about any sort of, uh, you know, pin on, on the D file. So, like, D7, yeah. I just want to. Yeah. Okay, so Haik Martirosian, very, very talented player who I had the pleasure of meeting. I was in Armenia back in October, and I hung out with many of these Armenian Eagle players. Ooh, very nice. nice person, very, very strong player. But Paul Velton is getting his way after winning that last game with the black pieces with that knight d4 move. He's using the d-file to his benefit in these games. Yeah. Um, he is... It is two pawns, right? Because he sacked a pawn already to get his D-pawn rolling. Right. Um, Black's got two extra doubled C-pawns. May not, may not be enough to cause too much trouble, but but Hike's pretty good. Well, actually, he may be able to stir something up. Yeah, you would love to say, like, transport this rook to D4 from E8 and just, like, try to clog the D-file and claim that, like yeah. you said, I have two pawns for the piece, and you're not going to be easily make progress, but it's not easy to see how your pieces get there. Because if you go rook D8... I'll take and get a queen. You take yeah. my queen on c8, and then I just can even take your rook on d8 and trade off my queen for these yeah. two rooks and claim that I have two rooks and a knight for a queen that's more than enough uh, to lead me to a winning edge. So it's looking yeah, very bad. I don't bad. really see how to do anything for black right now, but you know the rook on g3 seems out of place, so I'm wondering, like, is there no way to... But as long as white controls the d-file, it's kind of like... Ooh. It's kind of like he owns the only toll road around. But rook d8, let's say, I've rook takes g6 with check. That's a beautiful yep. tactical shot. And the point is your pawn is pinned on f7, and after king g6, I have queen f5 check, and my next check will hit the d8 square, and I'll win your rook on d8. So that's sort of the line. Okay, knight c2 was played to get to d4. Okay, so he's trying to get something to d4. That seems like the only logical idea. So Right. I approve of that. This... It's a good effort, but I think it will certainly not be enough here. It just doesn't feel like <coughs> there's nearly enough compensation for the piece. But, okay. There are many other games going on. This game between Abhijit Gupta and Hushinbeth looks really interesting. Be okay. Because if I, I saw Gupta's position on the corner of my eye, and I saw yeah. Pawn Storm in the center. Yeah. He's going... White's going all out to crack the center. He doesn't want it to be sort of a drawn-out, locked-up position where Black slowly bleeds him on C4. Exactly. And, and this is one of those positions, David, which is funny, where Black would love to throw the C5 pawn off the board. Right? Just like, please, just, here's my pawn. I want to be down a pawn. Because what you really mm -hmm. want to do is get counterplay against this pawn on C4, as we're talking about. Yeah. But with that pawn C5, this bishop-D3 knight D2 combination does well defend it. That said... It can also tie white down for a while where you can't actually maneuver your pieces. Your bishop on c1 feels, feels bad, man. It just stuck there, and you're definitely not going to b2 because you're in a brick wall. So at some point, white will like to play knight f3 and attack the center. And maybe that some point is now. I think he's going to trade on e5 once because, you know, Hushenbeth was thinking for a while here. I mean, ideally, he would like to put his dark squared bishop on e5 here, not a pawn, right? So in response to f4... I imagine he'd like to play bishop d6 or bishop f6 somehow, and he thought for a while and concluded that it wasn't quite good enough. Yeah, this, um, this pawn's not even really hanging on c4 because there's always queen a4 check if you haven't captured right. yet. Right, so now that he's played d6, I think you probably want to trade once for white. I mean, he makes a pass d pawn, it opens the f file, and it clogs e5 with a pawn instead of a bishop. Yep. Could there be anything better than that? This looks amazing for Gupta, and he's playing very fast. And Gupta, yeah. generally speaking, is a well-prepared player. In Isle of Man, he started four and a half out of five, I want to say. He beat Vidit. Uh, I think he drew Nakamura, if I'm not mistaken. So he is quite a good player. Now, okay, do I play E5 immediately or do I take on F4 first? I would play E5. You've just, you know, you've opened the kind of the floodgates here and E5 feels like the way to just keep pushing forward. 
I mean, it depends how you evaluate bishop f4, f6. Right. And then you probably just play e5 anyway there. Oh, I love um, it, David. I love it when so, you go full sacrifice. <laughs> but I mean, that's the thing, right? Like, if you think that that's good for white, then you can just do it, right? Um, but but he may have thought it's simplest to just play e5 first. Yeah, because this knight on e5 actually does well to protect c4. Bishop takes f4 will protect that knight. You can't play f6 mm -hmm. unless you want to get your bishop g6 check at some point hap well, immediately happening to you. Right. Right, that's yep, always, G6 always a fun tactic. Very effective. Because if you let me take with my queen, I'll give you a mate on f7. So, yeah, this is looking not fun for Hushibeth, who also is a very yeah. well prepared player. I've seen him blitz out 25 moves of theory in games, but this one looks like g5. Oh, yeah. Is it time for knight f7 and then bishop takes f4? I am a King's Gambit player, you know. Yeah, that. I, I, we have we have played that game <laughs> in the King's Gambit. Maybe bishop f4 right away. Same idea. Yeah. Wow, yeah. this is... The calm approach is bishop takes h7, right? Trying to play bishop g6, <laughs> basically. But then and, the queen like... d6 comes, right? There's some right. counterplay. But I, I like your idea with just bishop takes f4. Just take, take. Or throwing queen a4 check in first as a way to force the king to f8 and then oh, I take on f4. I totally forgot that side of the board. <laughs> but yeah, queen a4, sure. Yeah, you, <laughs> that looks pretty strong too. You forgot that this side of the board existed and you can force- I was like, I'm not gonna need that. I'm not, I, I don't care if you take on c4 anymore, even though white is so strongly placed that c4 is defended. I'm like, I'm gonna forget about those two pieces because I'm just gonna sack something on the king's yeah, side. But, but you're right, bishop f4 looks very strong as well. Because the problem is for black is you can't even play bishop f6. So let's say I take on f4. And you try to go bishop f6 to attack the knight and stop my knight from attacking f7. Queen a4 mm -hmm. check comes. You're going to do queen a4 again. Yeah. It's not fair that you keep seeing the whole board, but yeah, <laughs> it's a good move. And then knight d7 check as well comes. It's just, yeah. it's a problem. It's a big problem. Yeah. So bishop f4 I would have played maybe two minutes ago, but I do understand okay. why he's thinking he's up so much time. You really want to make sure that you're... You've got that much time and a good position. Yeah, this looks... I think... I think it's fair to invest some time. I, I, I tried playing 10-minute chess a couple times to have a feel for what this what this whole thing might be. And um, I noticed that, like, sometimes you'll do something that's sort of like you start you start playing sometimes a little bit like a blitz game. Just like, well, bishop f4 looks pretty good. Let me keep my time advantage. Yep. But then sometimes, sometimes the opponent with four or five minutes still has time to defend. So I don't think you want to be quite as cavalier as in blitz well here's a king's king's gambit move g3 <laughs> gupta is a man of of your own heart david just instead of sacrificing immediately playing that just smooth little g3 move but okay i, I really want <clears throat> to sacrifice to just sacrifice i mean what was black going to play if he played bishop f4 there i think the point was that he was in... i don't think queen a4 heard it at all right no because... I, I think just go f6 and he didn't see a, a knockout blow and so if mm -hmm. you're down a piece Okay, it still looks very good with knight d7 check or just swinging the rook to f1 first. But I think you just swing the rook to f1, and if now you're threatening knight d7 to f6, and if black plays king g8, you just play rook g4 and say, get back there. Yeah, that, ugh. yeah, that, that looks winning. But I can understand why if you feel like g3 is also pretty much just going to lead you to an almost winning position, that you would play the yeah. move that doesn't sacrifice. So, Well, g3 often leads to bishop h3, so Hushin Best sort of knows that and... Del it brings the bishop back to c8 to go bishop h3. Now he wants to play g4 yeah. after the rook moves. Lock his own bishop in, but also make sure that the f-file doesn't open. And very annoyingly okay. for white is that if this bishop was on d2, you're playing f takes g5 immediately and then just you know, ripping open the f-file. But with Yeah, I would not here, even think about that. Bishop d2, see? Yeah. There it comes. He, he did it. He's just going to take back. So he's going to take and play g4 now. It's not as smooth because you don't get the open f-file. That's very true. Yeah, g4 is a must. You don't want to allow this f7 pawn to come directly under target. f5, okay. But now... Yeah, he's got to open up that. Okay, he's just going to put his bishop on h6 check, force the king yeah. to g8, then take this pawn on g4, and then with the g file open, he's going to mate him. Seems pretty... I guess that's the hope, yeah. Seems... Maybe black will move the h pawn here, defend h6 with his rook, but, right? h5. But then f6 oh. comes in, right? Oh, yeah, we can't allow f6, sorry. Well, maybe you have to, honestly. Maybe h5 is a good move. And after h5, f6, okay, I can't take on f6 with knight d7 check, winning the bishop, but I can play bishop d6 and hope that I'm somehow surviving this really hideous-looking position. 
because I don't see a direct so here mirror. F6 is possible, right? F6, bishop F6, bishop H6, check. Oh. King H6, rook F6, check. And then just you get the F7 pawn and you just beat him down. Yeah, I mean, this knight takes F7 after, even after king H6, right? Just ouch, ouch town. Oh, that's right. You don't even have to play F6. You can just come to H6 anyway right away. Yep. So now queen D1 is just winning on the spot. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. funny, you know, yeah. you were saying not seeing both sides of the board. I hadn't even thought about moving this queen. And now yeah. that the king's on G8, you can't protect G4. Queen D1 yeah. just goes to G4 with checkmate. Queen D1 to G4, pretty simple. Um, I think H5 would have been better than this king march. Yes, 100% agree. Uh, <laughs> but um, but this was basically just very rough treatment by by Gupta <laughs> this, this game. Gupta, too strong. And a nice win for... The Delhi Dynamite. So, trying to think. Okay, King Loke. That's Loke Van Wille just beat Dimitrion Draken. Oh wow! And yeah, he won by resignation because White lost a rook. Like rookie four was played on move twenty eight by Van Wille, and he went queen a one, and, and then Van Wille just took the rook on d three. So that is showing you that even very, 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 very strong grandmasters blunder rooks for free. Yeah, oops. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but okay, there are still more games underway. We should probably go to live games, but I just want to show everybody to make the yeah. chat feel better that GMs are human too. All Whoa, right, this game... how about Surya trying to fend off an attack from uh, Okay, let's from New Thai 4, wow, that... Jean-Pierre Leroux. This attack looks vicious, but at the same time, white is up a piece, right? Yeah, yeah. He had to invest something in this. He sacked a piece. Um, it looks like he has some stuff here. Um, yeah. And actually, maybe White just has to trade that rook off. And then play knight g3 or something. And then rook it f1. It makes this nice pawn on f2, but. But, but knight g3 here. That's trying to. It takes the pressure off his king, right? Well, if knight g3, then d4. Right? Like, White would not want to face the move d4, opening up this diagonal against. The king, right? So knight g3, d4. What about knight to d4? That, Can I get away with that move? That looks safer. And then queen f6, you play rook f1, and all of a sudden I can't really right. protect my pawn on f2. Now this looks very strange. And then I'm like, thank good the knight defends f3. <laughs> yeah, this knight is multitasking here. No, this looks very good, knight d4. <laughs> you see in the chat, <laughs> Go Sagan saying like, I'll just blunder a rook and then when people ask me about it. Yeah, I saw that move in a GM game I memorized, so I played it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's a great That's a great one. And uh, thank you, Cash Mickey, for the bits. I see you donating there, so just want to give you a shout-out. But the game between Mikatarian and that's a Hike Martirosian and Paul Velton, this is the game where Velton won a piece on D7 a long time ago. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the game was like nice. looking crazy. It still is. But... Rook h1 check for black feels like the move. Because the, yeah. if you get a queen right away, I sack on g6, and I mate you immediately on the g7 square. Right. So if in this position, you go rook h1 check, the king has yeah. only one move to take it, then I get a queen with check, your king goes yeah. up, but if I take queen e4, you have queen h6, delivering me yeah. on g7 anyway. So He's not going to be able to defend this king. There's no way to do that. But it's just crazy how we got here. I thought this game would have been sort of calm white just you know trying to win up with peace uh -huh. this looks messier than how you usually expect an extra piece to be what rook, converted rook e5 i don't know he's made it so it doesn't matter what he does does it <laughs> he's like don't go to h6 there's a tasty rook right here <laughs> and even taking the rook for free is you know great rook takes g6 check wins on the spot yeah rook g6 check is, nah, this is over. queen h6 is a, is a quick mate yeah just going right for the mate and i see in the game chat at some point, Paul Velton declined a draw, so I don't know where a draw yeah. was offered, but that feels like a maybe not the politest offer whenever it happened. So, okay, that game is now done. Marty Rosian goes down to Velton. Velton, a hero right now. That is it. over a 100-point upset uh, between against a very strong yeah. Grandmaster. But who else is playing? That's huge. Um, Oparin is still playing. He's got a night end game against Jordan Van Forest. These are some pretty, pretty big names for board two. Van Forest is struggling, right? We saw him lose that game earlier. When... That B-pawn looks really good. Yeah, that B-pawn looks good. That D-pawn doesn't look too bad. But 
White is hoping to have compensation in the form of this two on one on the king side. If I can keep that king distracted, right, the black mm -hmm. king will have to run over to the king side, and then the king for white is going to try to pick up the remaining pawns. And I think. So knight b3 seems like a good blockade to use. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to play knight f3, do you? So let's. Probably got to blockade that pawn. Yeah, knight. Although now that I say that, I mean, it would be better to have. Which piece do we want on the queen side, ideally, in a knight endgame like this? If you have to divide your pieces between the king side and the queen side, I guess you want everything on the queen side. <laughs> yeah, because you can always play g5, h5, g6 and try to... Well, actually, yeah. what's interesting, David, and I wonder what you think, is if white goes g5, h5, g6, if black will play h6 to keep like a target on h5 and try to somehow win that pawn, I don't know if it actually works at all. Probably doesn't. Mm -hmm. But if I'm seeing a position, if we trade off... The, the last h7 pawn, I feel like you're not going to be able to keep yeah. your d and b pawn anyway. Right. So it, it looks like this game should be a draw with best play, but it takes a bit of work. Okay, but that's this is stopping my g5 stuff, because g5 you have king f5. Right. So maybe king... I mean, the space in the center is super important here, right? Because if the black king can get up and start threatening like king c4 and king to f4 and stuff, so white's king is going to fight him for space. Yep. That makes sense. Also, uh, the game between Maurice Sebat and Raunek Sedwani, that's champ 2005 against Etoile Genial. Genial, yeah. Genial. It looks, I mean, is, is this a draw by repetition? I see this rook coming from h4 to g4. And this, h4, g4, and this, it's already happened once. It'll probably happen once more. But what an interesting position. Like, can, does White have to make that draw? That was my first instinct. Was so White's got a rook against a queen, but... The knight is sort of trapped. You could put your rook on f8, for example, right? And try and claim that. Yeah, rook f8. Oh, they agreed on a draw as soon as we we're speculating. So thank you for, for the... clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, we could play it for another two minutes, but the commentators have started asking. So let's just tell them. Ooh, and Nihal Sarin against Marco oh, Baldoff yeah. with the, that's regular legs against Nihal Sarin. There are, both sides have right. dangerous looking past pawns. You got the crazy pawns again. White's got two of them and black's got one. So I would guess white's ahead. But bishop g6 is a big threat for black right now to close that, that rook is a good off. Threat. Should I play rook to g3 or something? So rook g3. Rook g5, rook g3. But rook g3, now at least this bishop covers the h pawn. So I'm trying to figure out if somehow. Right. I don't know how black would make progress. So this was played not just to play bishop g6, but it was also so that if white plays h7, black doesn't have to play rook h7, rook g2. Black wants to keep his keep the pawns on the king side because that's his big counterplay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, rook g3. That's definitely a needed move to get that rook yeah. on this side of the bishop. And so, okay, you can play rook h3 and try to win this e3 pawn. Right, try and grab on e3 with check and then pop back to h3. Yeah, so trying something like this. but then, Made a new source of counterplay for himself. But then this white king goes to d4, maybe even to e5 potentially, or to c5, mm -hmm. and the a, a pawn is starting to roll. I'm not, I think black might need to do something like that, but I, I'm not sure if it's, if uh, he's out of the woods yet, essentially. So it's interesting. Okay, we got to go back to the Oparin game as well. Okay, Rook h3 was just yeah. played in Niel Sarin, but... Okay. Opar at endgame. So he just goes for that. I was also calculating h7 after rook h3, but it didn't come up. <laughs> h, wow. Look at you. h7 is yeah. one of those interesting yeah. moves, but then black would take on g3. and Black would take, you queen, they queen, then you go queen e5, and I was looking for a mating net there. Oh, that's actually... Yeah. You're, you're on the endgame checkmate attack. That is really no. your theme today. Like You are the yeah. endgame checkmate wizard. Once you have an idea, sometimes you just stay focused on it. And sometimes, but okay, what's... sometimes it's a good idea because that looked very interesting. It was kind of cool, right? At least to speculate about. What about rook g7 now? Is rook g7 good? Okay, rook f2, similar idea. Similar idea. So just attacking f7, attacking the bishop. If your bishop goes to e6, you lose e4. If your bishop goes to g6, you cut off this rook once it takes on h6 from coming back to the queen side. So bishop g6 could even be met by bishop e8 as one option to win this f7 pawn. Or I would consider uh, rook f6, just to you know, sort of pin this bishop once you take on h6. But I think I like, yeah. oh, wait, that felt- <coughs> Yeah, it's time to move the a pawn. I thought, I like bishop e8, honestly. I thought winning that f7 pawn would have been- Ah, uh, 
the way to go because in fact I see if, what you mean. If you, I think he's he's going to try and queen this pawn while these pieces are sidelined so okay. he's going to now yeah play rook f6 like you were suggesting so he's going and now the threat is a7 king b7 rook a6 Ooh. um fact, and then if king a8 we can get an end game checkmate yeah <laughs> actually i it's definitely worth showing on the board so rook to a6 king 8 bishop c6 would be check and mate so yeah Rook f6 played. Maybe rook h8 just to stop all of these threats, but then rook c6 check. And this rook is going to land on b7. So rook c6 check, king move to b8, rook b6 check, and similar mating mm -hmm. attack, honestly. Yeah. Right? Like, you, you check on c6, where's that king going? You definitely don't want to go to d8, that's running away from the pawn. But if you go to b8, then I throw rook b6 check in. Yeah, I think this is the winning maneuver for white, actually. Um... Because I've seen with the rook on b7 and bishop on the long diagonal, I think it's I think it's a win. This is over. Rook b7 oh. check, bishop c6 game. I think there's no way to fight this 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 contraption. Yeah, it's resignation. You're, you're getting mated, and you have no actual useful move, because the mating idea is a7 and then rook c7 mate, right? And that's actually yeah. If you now rook c7 check and take the rook, it's a yeah. immediately winning. And then you just queen. And here comes the a pawn. Yeah, he's pretty moving it. Nice. Nice. Game over. And actually, yeah. that was beautiful by Neil Sarn, but I want to go back to your variation because I <laughs> now I'm very curious. You said after rook h3, h7, yeah. but maybe bishop takes h7 was the problem, actually. Well, then you can take... Oh, right. And then you can't take... But that. let's show... I want to show what you were thinking. <laughs> no, nah, you don't have to. No, I, I'm, I'm interested. A queen e5 check and going straight for checkmate, and this king is really in harm's way. I actually am not sure yeah. you're escaping... A mating net. At the very least, it looks like white will have some kind of perpetual, but that was a very yeah. interesting idea. Sometimes you need to do that, right? You need to... Sometimes you need that. Give up What he material. did was really instructive, though, this time, where he just... Where black was sort of greedy for the E pawn to have some kind of counterplay, but then the extra time it took him to collect the H6 pawn, he used to, to really just push that A pawn home. And maybe when black went bishop G6, that was the wrong square for the bishop. It, it made bishop E6... To protect the f7 pawn but i guess bishop e6 would have been my rook f6 anyway something like that protecting the pawn then he tries e3 and then uh just going a6 and so forth I don't yeah know, maybe yeah. Rook, oh actually rook h5 after rook f6 rook h5 is an option to hit the bishop and behind it the a pawn yeah. but c4 mm -hmm. yeah it's getting messy C4. here but clearly yeah. what happened in the game was not working for black and it was very nicely shown to us by neil Sarin that this mating maneuver was Pretty much unstoppable. So your mating attack comes true. I'll pull up the, let everyone know all the players and how they're doing. We see that Delhi and Mumbai have separation from the pack with eight and a half points out of a possible wow. 12. And if you look at their lineups. Wow, the two teams from India. Yeah, and, and I have the, the full board um, template up. We see that board one, both Vidit and Gupta, two out of three. Good, good enough. Mm -hmm. Board two. Two out of three for both Ganguly and Narayanan. Board three, two and a half points for the young Ranak Sadwani. Two points for the also the equally young, maybe slightly older. I'm not sure what their age difference is. Nihal Sarin. Mm -hmm. And then board four, this you know, Manu David Suthanjum finally got nicked for half a point. But finally nicked for half a point. Vinny the Pooh, Aditya Mittal is doing well to get those two points in on board four after losing that first game. So Yeah. They're running so away with this. The boss was to the other Indian player. In fact, given how many points these teams have, probably most of the points they don't have was from their match against each other. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to think who's disappointing me thus far because I'm looking at the results. I guess for Mar like Marseille, like Etienne Macros won half out of three. We saw him win a, a good game earlier. Oh my goodness. But look at the yeah, look at those bottom three boards. If you have time to click on the game that's finished between Manu David and Der Shach Affa, which means the chess monkey. Okay. Whoa, what the It is a very weird I was wondering just how did this guy drop a half point if he's, you know you know, he's so good. Let's let's see how he dropped it. And my goodness, he dropped it very, very weirdly. Because knight c seven <laughs> check is the problem in all these lines. Yeah. Is this some sort of weird theory? Like are we being trolled here? I, I don't know. What in the world? Also, but couldn't very, Black very have taken on B5? Right? Wait, what, what? why didn't Black take on B5? 
At which point? After bishop b5, instead of playing queen to b7, you take on b5, knight c7 okay. check. You, yeah. you lose your queen, but you have four minor pieces for a queen. Queen and rook, though. For a queen oh, it's a queen rook. and a rook. I, I'm missing yeah. a rook. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, don't do that. But don't do that. It still looks fascinating, but yeah, don't do that. Yeah, you could you could do that <laughs> if you really wanted to. It's a rapid game. <laughs> Minor pieces are great, you know. Yeah. They just sort of cover I, everything when you got four of them. I don't know if I've ever seen that dynamic before, though, with um, four minor pieces for queen and rook. I, yeah. I can't tell you, but. I mean, I would say this: two minor pieces are a lot better than a rook. Two minor pieces are a bit worse than a queen. Makes it all together. It's equal. Just a dead. Draw. I'd say it's actually about equal. I think you could play that if you really wanted to. Yeah, but it's too <laughs> risky in a team event. I, it's interesting. It's okay. I want to know: is this some kind of some? It is some kind it's of got... book draw. Like, oh, let's get Greg yeah. Shaw to do the research for us. Greg, I know you can yeah. hear me. It's some kind of book draw until one of us decides to try this as black and play it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to... All right, the king has begun. All right, so King Loke, yep, is playing Bakro. Vinny the Pooh versus Blitzstream. That looks like it's going to be a fun one. Duda versus Vidit. Okay, I know where my attention is going to be, at least out of the corner mm -hmm. of my eye at all times. But I, I'm pulling up the Vidit game against Duda, and yeah. Vidit moving very quickly. Duda moving a little less quickly, but we see that in a Rogozin, the knight is on c6, and you would love it if you could play pawn c7 to c5 without moving your knight. That would be the ideal way to play. But that's why you play queen a4 check, is to put this knight on c6 first so that black yeah. will be stuck with this backward c pawn. Right? A rook will come to c1. You know, If you put your pawn on c6, then your light square bishop is totally miserable, and you're not going to be able to play c5 anytime soon. So I think this setup is... <laughs> oftentimes very pleasant for white, particularly in speed chess. So black wants to play a5 at e5 now, if he, yeah. Yeah, e5, e5 is. And then if d5, maybe e4. Here comes e5. Yeah, and if white takes on e5, he'll have to trade on c3 with check and then take back on e5 with his knight, and that position looks golden for black. Yeah, for sure. And castle, because now knight d5 is an annoying threat. So if you, and if you take on c3, you improve white's pawn structure. So there is a lot of theory here, and they're Oof, playing this yeah. out right now. Um, so knight d5, the point, queen d6 protects this bishop on b4, but at the end of this variation, I'm be able to take on d4 back with my knight. So that's the good news for white. The bad news is, well, we're going to have an even number of pieces on the board. That's, uh, yeah. th the, the pawn islands are different. Three on two for black on the queen side, four on three for white on the king side. Um, the, but white is a little bit ahead in development, so that's where the right. advantage might come into play. Yeah, the queenside pawn majority traditionally is considered to be a small advantage for black in those end games. Yeah. Um, but a little bit better development for white should should cancel that out just fine. You know, you can quickly get a rook to the c file, and the majority will be under control for now. <laughs> yep. And Vidit thinking that, but do I want to trade queens right with queen takes before, or do I want to? Keep the queens on by knight takes b4, but I think I would have traded the queens because knight takes b4 yeah. looks like it simply runs into knight takes d4 if I rook d1, and I don't like the fact that my queen on d6 is pretty vulnerable to attack. Yeah, maybe this is too superficial of me, but if I'm black, I usually like feel like I'm trying to equalize. I'll play I'll play for some more trades like queen b4. Yes, and if I'm slightly behind in development, I would also. Um, prefer to maybe take the queens off here rather than having this knight sort of dangling to white's queen. Yep. Um, so I would have just played queen before. I wouldn't have thought about it. Yeah, no, I, I sometimes being superficial is not the worst thing in the world, and I totally agree with you that you've and now queen before is played. It's strange to me that it took a minute and a half to make that decision. Maybe he mm -hmm. took a bathroom break or a snack break mid-game. Um, mm -hmm. But... Yeah. Yeah. Should have done that two minutes ago between rounds. <laughs> 100% agreed. And white is ahead in development, and this bishop on c8 is always a nuisance because where do you put it? Right? Like, do you put it on g4 and try to reroute to g6 square? A3 is an immediate I mean, threat. I try and play c5 to kick the knight and give myself more options for my bishop. But the problem with c5 is then you give the d5 square, right? So then you feel like, oh, this bishop will just sit on d5 eventually and then I'll yeah. have to deal with that. So bishop d7 is a way to meet a3 with knight c6, so you don't totally ruin your structure. Right, then knight to b5, rook to c8. Yeah, so you can do some kind Just of... some holding on moves. 
yeah, rook c8, maybe eventually you can play knight e5 and just get out of it in a way that's not too harmful for black. Uh, black is just a couple moves away from equalizing. Any sort of slow move by white, black plays rook fd8, king f8, c5, like you were suggesting, uh, and the worst is definitely behind him. So, okay, knight c6 played. But what if I just play rook d1 here and like let you take on d4 so I can double my rooks? And there's rook d1. Yeah. There's just like this slight pressure because white's pieces feel better placed. That, that's how I generally like view these positions. I, I'm just always feel like there's a, a little weakness here, a little bit p passivity in this variation. And right. it makes you feel uncomfortable. But I, I think a player of Vidit's caliber doesn't have the same fears that I do. Yeah, I was thinking of rook d8, and I was sitting here calculating like rook d8, knight b5, and then trying to move the bishop instead of playing rook a to c8. Huh. But um, I think he might just have to play rook a to c8. Which is, again, one of those sad moves that you play. And then maybe rook to d2 is an option, or right. bishop d5. And the knight can go back yeah. to c3 rather than back to d4 to come to the d5 square. It just feels like the plans are more accessible <laughs> for white, even though yeah. black has no clear targets to exploit that's really the yeah thing. but the sad way of playing for black is feeling kind of sad to me with like knight b5 rook c8 because then rook d2 i have to play like a6 because i can't really challenge the d file when my rook's defending c7 so well play a6 knight c3 then the knight's going to come back to d5 i'm starting to have some weaknesses yeah and even if you trade all the rooks, you're a little bit more passive as white, as black anyway. So then you're like, yeah. um, then this four on three on the king side can start pushing as well. I just think these little things add up psychologically, even if objectively the position is totally fine. So, yeah. okay, we'll, we'll see how Vidit and Duda handle this. We should maybe see if there are other games. Okay, Loke Van Whaley has just been a highlight king today. Like he, he won a rook for free in that last game. Now he's playing Etienne Bacro <laughs> and he's got a pawn on C6. And he's not even yeah. down a pawn to have that pawn there with the ugly double B, uh, excuse me, A pawns for black. Isn't Van Willie just mm -hmm. like, completely winning here? The... I mean, if white, if if black can't win the pawn on c6 in like you know a move or two of forced moves, then I would guess white's winning. Yeah, and knight b3 to come after the A pawn comes to mind. So to protect not only to win a pawn, you protect <laughs> c6 in additional time. I'm going to support my extra plus pawn <laughs> by capturing another pawn of yours and outposting my knight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, rook b1 yeah. seems like a very logical move just to throw my rook to b7 or to b5. Oh, so many good-looking moves. I don't see what black can... I don't even see how black starts to attack this pawn, unfortunately. The g2, c6 diagonal seems pretty solid for the white bishop. This looks terrible for Buck Buckrow. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I'm going to have to, yeah. because my eyes hurt me looking at Black's position here. My, okay, you're going to have to move on. Yeah, my, but, uh, might have to look we've got a good comment from the chat from Mr. Dodgy Chess saying that he thinks that uh, Van Whaley skipped all of Wake on Zay preparing <laughs> for this. So he spent like two to three weeks just getting ready for, <laughs> I actually, for what we're seeing today. I saw him in Wake on Zay because uh, I was doing commentary there and he was hanging around a little bit. So uh, yeah. it was really nice to see him. He's got, you know, his family was there as well for a couple of days, so it, it was cool. But, okay, sorry, Etienne, I really just can't look at your position anymore. The game between right. Albano... What's going on in Kevin Bordy's game? Okay, I'll go there. Let's see. He, Whoa. He's uh, got black against Vinny. Vinny the Pooh. So black is not down any material and has a very nice-looking position, in my opinion, because F2 feels weak. Once right. these bishops get traded, traded, they just traded the d4 for d5 pawns in a fancy way. Okay, let's see how fancy they go. Um, Ooh. A white took on d5 with the knight because the queen was undefended on d7. Nice. Um, so knight f5 comes, and now he sort of needs to move his knight because it's really threatened. And then what's coming up? So I feel like black might have some kind of tactic on the king side. That's what I'm looking for as well. Bishop takes g2. Has to be a good move, right? Like, because if I go bishop g2, you you have to take back on g2, and then I have e5 with knight well, what? 93 check okay. discoveries. e5, yeah. Because if you take on e8, I just move my bishop back to a8, and your knight. But bishop f2, that's what I wanted to. Oh. 
ask about because on queen d4 they can't play bishop e3 because the queen's undefended and if the king goes to f1 then you switch oh you oh, no, take you on g3 no you take on g3 you there. Have to play knight g3 check oh my gosh you honestly you're just seeing every sort of potential checkmate this looks oh bishop eight oh can't go bishop a6 i almost blundered that but knight takes g3 yeah my original idea was to follow up with bishop a6 so that's okay so worry, we, we we're, we're teammates here right we're, we're partners so we're blundering together I've always yeah. heard a commentary team that blunders together stays together. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. No, this That's looks over. For next week. Kevin, Kevin Bordy just, just yeah. bringing... That's really bad for Mumbai because they're, they're keeping pace with the Delhi Dynamite and not looking too fun to have the white pieces in this game. Yeah. So where... Else. Kevin's probably feeling it here. Ooh, the game between Champ 2005, I believe that's also a Mumbai mover. That's Roundex Sadwani. He has the black yeah. pieces against Haru Harutian Barsegian. So an Armenian name player, so Armenian right. ethnicity, but playing for Khan. And, okay, I'm going to flip the board because I have the, the black. Yeah, you got this, this early night outpost on F5. Should be a very good position for white. Just this G5 pawn, can I just throw my rook? Well, if I throw my rook from A1 to G1, then maybe I lose the A pawn, which seems totally irrelevant to the position. But then black mm -hmm. is going to storm with B5 and try something over there on the queen side. Yeah, honestly, A5 looks like a mistake to me because the pawn on A4 I thought was already doing doing the job. Yep, I agree. Um, so, And if A5 is going to then make us play rook to A1, then I'm really not happy about it. Yeah, very strange, because usually you play a5 if your knight can go hop into b6. But the bishop on d8 stops that, and it looks like... How does white make progress? G, the, going after the g-pawn seems to make sense, but then black can always retreat that knight away from f6 if you start doubling rooks. And I don't see a way to actually pick up steam over there on the king side. And if that's the case, then black may turn the tables. Yeah, or, or do one of those things where... For like thirty moves, nothing is traded in the King's Indian defense. <laughs> well, what I, I mean, another thirty moves from here, right? Like right. maneuver, maneuver, maneuver. W one idea I have, David, is like King F8, Rook G8, Rook C7, Rook over other Rook over the King side, right? Because that Rook on okay. C8 could be useful on the <clears throat> H7 square if I just like. And then you want to bust the King side open at some point for Black with G4. Exactly. So Rook C7 here first. Okay, Bishop C7. Is he gonna go Queen D8 and just try to win the A pawn like? Is he, Tuck is, the bishop somewhere pretty surprising. Rook H G one. <coughs> okay, I don't know about that. Like you're, you the G pawn is impossible to put more pressure on. Honestly, I kind of like Black's position. Rook B eight here is something that comes to mind. Maybe because that rook on G seven. If I'm being extra, David Pruis checkmate idea mindset, I'm thinking yeah. I go Rook B. B8, eventually go B6, and then throw my rook from G7 over to the B file. But okay. that's probably way too long story and ridiculous. That um Yeah, that could be a could be a surprise apparition for the White King when suddenly the rooks are doubled on the B file. <laughs> it's like one of those things that just shocks you when you have under a couple minutes in your clock and you just see the rooks yeah. slide in and you get scared. Like, what? What? Yeah. B2. Um, okay, but there's gonna be a lot of there's gonna be a lot of maneuvering here. Maybe there's yeah. there are other games that ooh nobody's yet decided what side they're going to. So Paul Velton against Ganguly. We're enjoying Paul Velton's games tremendously so far, but right now his king does not feel very safe on f8 with Ganguly just a rook d3 maneuver like queen a6 check followed by rook d3 might be lights out. Yeah, and actually just there was a there was a piece sack to get here, but White's got three pawns. And amazing pieces so you're kind of guessing that white's white's got the advantage yeah queen h6 king g8 rook d3 maybe the queen takes a five though yeah. as like a you queen f5 rook g3 queen g6 yeah and just hope that your two minor pieces and rook are good enough against queen and three pawns but three yeah. pawns is just so he's not even allowing it right he's he's waiting with queen h6 yes and i guess if you're if you're moved to stop all this is queen h8 you might as well just tip your king over. So wait, how do, this is yeah. it's checkmated immediately. Queen h6. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> normally I have a lot to say, but after rook g3, queen g3, pawn yeah. takes g3, all I can say is yeah. check and mate coming. Yeah. 
So this looks yeah. Black is uh, out of relevant pieces at this point. <laughs> His only relevant was one was the queen, and he's got to sack it. So bye bye. All right. Yeah. So where else can we go for Nighty-night. exciting chess? This I see this game between Hushenbeth and Vlad- oh. Vladimir. <laughs> You know, the game that we thought might take another 30 moves, like everything got traded off. So you could click back there so people see where it went. Uh, let me find that game. Um, it was Champ against How- found, Harut. Found it. What? Yeah, that was an amazing, right? We're like, <laughs> it could be 30 moves of maneuvering. And then somehow they traded every single piece. After Knight F4 on move 37, they just get rid of every single piece. All the rooks come off, the queen comes off. And then we're going to see another million moves in this game. Okay. Now another million move maneuver. Yeah. The game that's inter- looks, interesting. Looks like a draw. <laughs> should be, right? It seems very blockaded. But perhaps white can go B4, right? And actually play for more. Uh-huh. Like you just start, you know, start making right. a little progress on the queen side. The H pawn's not going anywhere. Well, maybe at some point you go H4, king H6, king H5, knight G5. I mean, very wishful thinking, but something to keep an eye on. But the game between Hushinbeth mm-hmm. and Andraken. Okay. Andraken is currently up, oh, sorry, down, pardon me, two pawns with the black pieces, opposite color bishops. So mm-hmm. that bishop on a7 hitting f2 feels a little uncomfortable, but I think Andraken just down two pawns. Yeah. Andraken, I didn't pick for my fantasy team, although he's very, very good in over the board rapid tournaments and has a very high FIDE rapid rating. In the pro chess league, he hasn't been dominant he hasn't been like an out of control force yeah he's done fine um but um but he hasn't completely dominated and here we see hushin beth successfully competing with him yeah the move c4 comes to mind for sure for white just breaking open this pawn chain opening up the bishop on yeah. f3 looks like hushin beth is going to score a victory for the berlin bears he has certainly good chances to do so you want to check back on loek he put his knight on a5 like you said but somehow bakro hasn't lost yet has he he's no he's like but only down one pawn and c6 might fall next in which case but somehow he dealt with this diagonal i don't know how that makes any sense but but david i want to go to the game between vidit and duda very quickly okay. because it's yeah. your style it's mating attack in the end game ah i thought that yeah duda wins a piece yeah it looks like he's looks like he's doing it so the king has to come up and then he can just take with his knight yep. and that's not too fun no but i, I was looking right the knight went to <laughs> yeah a, went around a little bit he went to move e5 and move 43 a very nice yep. pawn sack temporary to win the g pawn yeah and look at i the, don't think he i don't think he had much of an advantage before this but this this knight maneuver yeah that pawn sack into the knight maneuver turned the tables yep so look at him go. And now he just needs to untangle that knight in time to not let the pawn queen on c1. We did say that white's position always felt just more comfortable. And so yeah. I think that probably really helps in a speed chess game because you don't have time to spend five minutes per move like you would in classical. He just won the game. So that we can come back to the specifics of this game later. But yeah. a nice win, huge win. Probably for a very high quality game, right? Squeezing a small edge, never letting Vidit quite get equality. Right. <sighs> For sure. Um, so that that's really nice. I put back the Van Whaley game on because that ending that we're about to get seems pretty interesting. That pawn on c6 still looks very strong. Is black going to take on e4 with the rook and then just try to win the other c pawn? Like knight takes c6 will be hanging in almost every variation. Oh, it took with a pawn there. What? What? I'm confused. Whoa. So now white has the C pawn still for a little bit. Yeah, that seems like a risky decision by Bakro here because material is even, yeah. but now I'm looking at the seventh rank. Rook B7, Rook D7, you might just get checkmated. The knight and A5. Yeah, I can't let both of those in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, one should be enough, right? So maybe black should play Rook, no, Rook E5 is by Rook B5. That's a huge problem. Like, I want to go Rook E5 to just get your knight off A5 and win the C pawn. But if it's uh-huh. met by rook b5, you definitely don't want to trade on that square. No, this looks very double-edged in some regards because if rook yeah. b5 comes, now there's potential rook g5 check. The king might get forced in the h file. Right. So he could get some counterplay over there. So wait, what's wrong with rook e5 now? 
I, I imagine that's what he'll play after he thinks for a little bit. A6. Oh, the A-pawn was hanging while protecting the knight. Okay, that, I was like, A6, wh- where is that relevant? But <laughs> now I get it. Okay, so C7 at some point is something that you should keep in mind, but probably not yet. Yeah. How do I get this rook on D2 into the game? Well, oddly, on C7, rook E7, you could play knight C6. Uh, um well, rook takes c7, knight e7 check, then king, king f8, and then you, you rook on b7. Oh, you go to f8. Or... Yeah, you were trying to be sneaky. I know what you were trying to do. <laughs> you know what I wanted. Yeah, you wanted a winning knight fork in the end over here. Yeah. But I, I, All right. if white had this rook on d1, then the rook would go to b1 and b7. But now rook e5 came in the game, he could take on a6. Yeah. That looks like a good pawn to take. Yeah. But rook g5 check, this king feels... It's mildly uncomfortable. I mean, if I'm Van Willey, I'm taking on a6. And, oh, is he going to play knight, about, knight b7? How about... Uh, is knight b7 somehow possible? Oh, he played it. Played it. Because if rook c6 blunders to rook a8 check, king f7, yeah. knight d8 check, and there's another nasty knight fork. Yep. That's what these end games are all about when people have low time. It's like... Being the one to land the nasty knight fork. Yep. It's a rook g5 check right. played. To- Get in the corner. Get in the corner. Nobody puts... Knight e5. Uh-oh, knight e5, knight f3 check is coming, and c6 is falling as well. Yeah. Well, if he'd gone to h4, then after h6, then, like, you know, black has their choice of how to mate him eventually. Right. Once his knight, knight will come to f4. <coughs> but this... Why rook f8? Why not knight e5? Oh, uh, you know, he was, he was told to use all his pieces by his teacher. True. Good, good teacher that Buckrow has. I cannot believe Buckrow is going to win this game. How is in the world after he might not hit true? But not. look at ninety one, knight f three, okay. rook g one, mate. That's the. That's the. Maybe I could still stop this. How about h four? Okay, h4. knight f three, king h three. That's only a draw, at best. Okay. What are all my moves? So why do you play rook f8 first? Is I, um, I don't understand it at all. I rook don't f- know either. Rook f8 did not look like a useful move. So here can... Oh, wait, but now knight f... So, hmm. Yeah, I guess the draw is what's going to happen. Because I, I wanted to play you know, rook g6 followed by rook f4, but I obviously can never do that. As white is going to play rook d8 in the meantime. And yeah. Yeah, this is just going to be a draw. Knight f3 check, king h3. And I just want to show everybody why king h1 is not possible, just to... <laughs> sure, it's a good thing to know about. You know, this is actually a very, you know, it's thematic, right? Knight in... Yeah. When you have this knight in f3 or in f6, your king cannot get caught in the corner. Hey, um, Robert, what would have happened... Yeah. ...if after knight to e1, white had played rook to d1, trying to cover the checkmate on g1? Uh, instead of h4. Instead of h4, so rook d1. I guess he didn't want to... Rook f2 check, king h1, rook f1 check, king h2, knight f3 check, and mate. That would have been fun. That would have been a nice way to to mate this king. No squares available. Yeah. Okay, but a nice hold for Bakro after what looked like a horrendously... Yeah. I mean, horrendously awful doesn't even cover how bad it that opening was. So bad. Um, Hushin Beth and Andraken are still battling it out, so that's an important game. Um, this looks, and they're still queens on the board, so there's potential. It looks so much better for Andraken than it did before. Like all of a sudden, White went from being very active and trying to checkmate to like Bishop B6 coming, and he might lose. Well, somehow he played C4 at the wrong time and lost the C pawn instead of cracking the long diagonal open on D5. So. Andraken has, so far, I mean, ever since we started watching this game, has been able to keep the white oh. bishop completely out of things with this pawn yeah, structure. He fell for a tactic of c4, bishop d6, but we can... Oh, now he's losing his rook on d2. Oh, my. What a turnaround. So now, he's, now he's lost. He's completely lost. He's down a queen yeah. for a rook here. Yeah. So queen d6, play e5, play e4, game over. Wow. Time yeah. pressure. That's really... The problem is Hushinbeth has been getting into... Really, really bad time trouble, and will right. that cause you to lose many games? But positionally speaking, I mean, what decided this game was was that Andraken really managed to keep that bishop on f3 out of the game. Hushinbeth didn't find the right time to play c4, 
I think he knew that to some extent that he wanted to play C4, but he just couldn't quite couldn't quite make it happen. Right. Not good. So do we have any other games that are more evenly matched in the final seconds here? In the final seconds. Let's see. Nihal Sarin's got an end game here where he's got six seconds on the clock and White's trying to promote an A pawn against him. That's okay. an equal material knight end game. So I'm trying to find that game real quick. Oh, there it is. Oh, he's playing against Sargsyon. Whoa. That A pawn's rolling. Okay, so he yeah. sacrifices the knight because what Black is going to have to do is sacrifice his rook for the pawn. Although yeah. Was putting the rook there a good decision? Okay, I guess the knight is always going to be able to escape. So knight d3 comes with check. That way the knight's not stuck on e1. Mm. Is he going to get mated in there? It was getting close. Is he going to get mated in there? Ah. Uh, no. Looks like it's a rook. What? Hopefully rook takes. That way he can play rook a3 and win the a pawn. Right. So the king should move here, right? He should just move yeah. away. And now get a queen. Or just actually take the knight. King takes a four. Or just take the knight and march the king over. Yep. King here, and then the king goes to b7. Boop. You can play... King D King to E6. <laughs> yeah, that looks pretty good. Can always just play Rook A5 as well. So King E6, yep. Yeah, once our King's out of the way. So now Rook A5. Yeah, very well done. And then King Look at that. The all-star, Shunt. Shunt? Taking out the high-rated young GM. Too good. Well, that was really nice. That was pretty. We have another end game left between. Pretty well done. Johannes Florstedt and Leia uh -huh. Garifulina. Yeah. So she, uh, she's up a rook for a knight, but look at this configuration here. It's hard to break it. Yeah, I don't know if there's enough to win this position. So what would be the winning plan? So go rook h1, put the rook on king c4 here. Yeah, king c4 is good. No, 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 no. Because now king goes to, if you go king c4, king a7 will cover the b6 square. Uh -huh. Okay, but now king c7. Okay. Oh, now rook oh no, 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 yeah. no, no. You have to move. <laughs> that, made it, that made it too easy. This is That's too easy. Th this is a huge upset. Look at the rating differential here. We wanted some more tension there. Yeah, this made it way too simple. I mean, well, as soon as the resignation happens, which is or losing on time, even. Okay, I was looking for an intense endgame that I didn't understand. Yeah, right? Like, we see the king with the d6, and of course the idea is to finally make progress getting to c7. But after rook c7, play a move like knight b8. And then try to go knight a6, or if the rook moves away from the c5, go knight back to c6. It doesn't look good, but at least you're holding on. Like, rook c8, knight a6. The point is that yeah. if you have to play c6, then we're in a rook versus knight, which is almost always theoretically drawn, unless someone's getting checkmated or losing their knight. So, I mean, leaving the knight here was a really bad decision at this point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, um, one perhaps notable result among the you know dozens of games that just finished um, is that Manu David lost with white against the Armenia Eagles manager, Artak Manukian. What? Where's, let me pull that game up because... And since I didn't know that Manu David was 2,400, I had actually picked Manukian for my uh, for my fantasy team. He's by, by no means the highest rated board four. He's one of the lower ones, but I just had that Eagles feeling. So how, how good do you feel? I feel amazing, right? Yeah. He, he beat the secret weapon. I mean, you just, you knew. You, you knew that... You didn't even know that he was underrated, but you still knew <laughs> to trust in Artak Manukian. It's more a lack of knowledge, if anything, right? Because if I'd known the guy was 2,400, I might have picked him. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes a lack of knowledge is a good thing, especially in these kind of like yeah. fantasy selections. If you're, you know, anyone who does March Madness brackets for college basketball, sometimes knowing too much is just a terrible thing. Right. You, know, you never win the bracket that way. Yeah, so, hey, you just marched the C-pawn down the board and won. Beautiful. Yep. Boom, boom. So the next round should start in a minute. I think they start every yeah. half hour. Yeah. And so you want to show people the standings and see who's who's looking to win this battle royale? I don't think I think they're in the process of being updated because it looks uh, it okay. looks the same as um, the last time. But I can show. I definitely yeah. want to pull up the standings from bef the the league standings from before I, today. I wonder if the Eagles gained a little ground there on the. Uh, 
Uh, Since we just saw, you know, their manager win a game. Yeah, it can't hurt. And we, and we saw Sar and we saw Shant Sargisian beat Nihal Sarin. So it looks like it looks like they scored at least a couple points against the Dynamite. Yeah, no, they uh, and Mikatari and Drew. So they, they and Zavin beat Gupta. They got three and a half out of four against the three Dynamite. Three and a half. So that's going to flip the the standings completely yeah. there. Yeah. And I have the uh, league standings up here for everybody who um, has cool. been following or who has not been following. You can see that the Chengdu Pandas currently lead the league, and they have just been amazing. They scored quite well in the Battle Royale on Tuesday. And we are focusing on teams in the Central Division and the Eastern Division, where the Battle Royale pits teams from different div divisions. And so we see Amsterdam Mosquitoes, the Con Blitzrooms, the Migrants who have been struggling uh, really badly this season. So we actually are dealing with some of the lower-ranked teams in the Central Division. But on the other side, the Eastern Division, we have the Armenian Eagles, who are just kind of barely trailing the Tbilisi gentlemen. And then the Mumbai Movers are in striking distance. And from there, the Delhi Dynamo and Volga Stormbringer. So, yeah. It's worth a lot of points today. It's worth a lot of points today, Robert. Yep. I mean, you can get, you can get 40 points pretty easily. If you get first place, you'll definitely get more than, more than 40, I think. So, there can be some flip into the standings. Yep. For sure. And yeah, and because you're playing you know, all four boards of the other team, as we just saw the Armenian Eagles destroy the Delhi Dynamite, right? Like it's very easy to just fl flip the script and say, well, you were at first, but I just went three and a half to four against you, and now I've just leapfrogged you. So, yep. Let's wait in a moment for matches to get underway. Yep. They've started. They've started. It's the Dynamite against the Blitzstream here. Getting going. On board one, it's Abhijit Gupta against Duda. Yep, I got that game open. And Gupta, once again, allowing his opponent to take on C3 and getting these double yeah. pawn structure. And we saw him play a very nice game over Hushinbeth in a similar structure. But here, Duda is just trying to control the E4 square. Yeah, well, Gupta's, Gupta's got it. He, he got control of E4. Yeah, that's a very important break. So takes, take, take yep. queen takes. Takes, takes, knight c6. Yeah, white just feels position, a little happy. This position must be opening theory since they each have 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty standard opening theory, but white tends to feel good when you get this e4 move in, and you right. have now a semi-open e-file to work with. d5 will be more powerful at the right moment, um, but mm -hmm. knight a5, of course, is annoying because the c4 pawn is weak. And in fact, if you play yep. d5, you're trying to win this pawn e6, but oftentimes black doesn't mind losing this pawn because the pawns left behind for white are so uh, poor Ooh. on the queen side. So D This is a nice maneuver. The knight gets to quite a good outpost on c5. Yep. <coughs> In fact, or not. using the c5 square for the bishop. And a3 is hanging. Oh, wait, this is going to be a problem in the end game with this a pawn. Wow, he's blitzing this all out, and he is happy to lose the e6 pawn, as you said before. <laughs> Yeah, because the, once you lose the e6 pawn, you just leave white with this really bad pawn structure on c4 and c3. And now this a pawn can roll down the board even to a3 in the near future. This game is full of surprising moves, isn't it? I mean, y weren't you also expecting this bishop would hang out on c5? Yeah. And he comes to d6. Yeah. There's, there's been some surprises. I thought knight a5 to b3 was coming to c5, hitting the queen, outposting and controlling everything. He trades the undeveloped bishop on c1. He's a rebel without a cause. But he seems to really know what he's doing. Like he wants to play he wants to play the end game, right? If rookie won, he can take on e6. And if you want your pawn back, you have to trade queens. Yeah, and that's precisely what uh, so let's say we get this queen trade. The other rook was probably smarter to use, but just to show the end game dynamic here, double c pawns gross. Moves like rook f4 immediately come to mind to win the c4 pawn. A5 will yeah. come into the game. So that's not a good trade for Gupta. No, Duda has completely won this opening battle, and I love his position. Yeah, it looks like Duda's found his form. Um, he's now in first place among board ones with two and a half points. Yep. Um, so he's shaken off that, that, that Petrov, and uh, he's getting to work. Yeah, so we'll let Duda try to win this one. I love his position, but there have to be yep. so many other interesting games 
because, well, just by numbers, there's so many games going on. Just by numbers, there's so many. How about this game between... Uh, where does that game go? I just had it. This game between... Oh, there's some instructive structures. Yeah, Mad Dog 94 and Vinny the Pooh. We like Vinny the Pooh. And look at this last move. So white one E3 and black one E4. <laughs> they, they are just having a good time here. So pawn takes E3. Yeah. The bishop's having a stare down. You have to take on G7. Then black will get E takes F2 intermezzo. But the question is, is this either nice for black because you've given white an isolated pawn? I actually just like white's position. Bishop G7. Or is it, or is it somehow bad for black because you've weakened your own dark squares and, and it's weird? And the knight can just jump to C3 and potentially D5. It's mm -hmm. very interesting dynamic. Yeah. It's a little bit off the beaten path, so it's not so obvious how to evaluate. And actually, white can even consider playing e5 here as a way to keep the bishops on the board. I wouldn't do that because I don't want to give the black knight the f5 square. But if you really uh -huh. are fearing a bishop trade, you could make him move like e5. Very weird right. position. So, okay. Yeah. Absolutely confusing. Yeah, and I'm so confused that I, don't, I need to go somewhere else because... <laughs> you need to hide from it. Yeah, I, I don't know. How to evaluate. How's Vidit doing against King Loic in that same match? Vidit, he has the white pieces, the e4 pawn is well defended. The knight will come to f5, like you go knight d4, knight f5 knight kind d4. of thing. This bishop on h7 is good for the moment, pinning this e4 pawn, but it can become, if you're not careful, just a very bad piece. The other thing white could do is instead of playing knight f5, they could just play f3 and play against that bishop. Right. Right, so now look at that knight d4. That's sort of a choice as well. Yeah, it's going to sit on the position a little bit. And this, the square d4 is very well protected. White wants to get out of this pin, so the, the e4 pawn is protected. If you could play f4 and queen f2, like in one move, then you'd be so happy to the next play e5 and just start seizing a huge initiative. Just expand that whole majority over there. Yep. So... So what's black going to do? Play knight e5 before any of that happens? So they've got knight c4 as a resource. Yeah, knight e5 I mean, to c4. You have to watch out for bishop f1. But yeah, bishop f1 is actually a threat right now. Out, right? right? If you go rook f8, bishop f1 comes in. And where's your queen going? Uh... Exactly. That's, that's the right answer. Because <laughs> no matter where your queen goes, I'm going to fork your queen and darkster bishop with your knight. Whoa! Knight... What? Knight? <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. I guess this is a sort of a typical idea, but definitely yeah. it was catching me off guard here. But does this work? Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> like, like, okay, knight takes d5. <laughs> sure. C d5, knight f5, let's say. Okay. Makes sense. A bishop would probably have to take on e3. And then I'll take back with my knight on e3 and make use of the fact your d-pawn is pinned to your knight on d7. Okay. Yeah, you're making use of it. That's very rude. <laughs> Never claim to be polite. Not once. Yeah. No, no. Not, 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 not the key thing for a chess player to do either. Like, you're supposed to hurt your opponent. Yeah, so... Uh, that seems pretty good. I don't see an answer for black, really. Yeah, because you don't want to take on f5. Whenever white puts his knight on f5, you really don't want to give an unopposed light square bishop in a position like that with some long diagonals to work with. So, yeah, to me it's looking like this knight d5 move was made more so out of, like, I didn't like my position very much, so let's, let's sort of... Well, that doesn't lose a pawn, at least. Maybe that's what black will have to resort to, is the bishop takes f5 move. Yeah, so, like, let's get there. So, bishop f5. At least oh, the actually, you king can... is loose in the resulting position, yeah, you right? you take on f5, ef, bishop e3, f e3, and this pawn on e3 might not be so strong either. Right. That's a good point. d5 looks weak, but e3 is... Also similarly weak. That might be the way to right. go. And you three. White's moved like a lot of kingside pawns at that point. All of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the most you can. <laughs> yeah. The, the, but I don't see another move. I guess you can... Okay, there's knight of five, so... There's knight of five. So bishop of five, right. maybe there's bishop c5 first. Okay. Oh, because still taking on e4 has like problems on f8 and d7. Yeah. And, ooh. So, so bishop f5, bishop c5, rook f c8 might be the only move there. And then I'm happy to take finally, I think, on f5. And, or rook takes d5. Rook takes d5, no. I think, is what you want to or do. Rook no? d5, you go bishop e6. Bishop e6. Uh. But if I go take on f5, then you'll still have this weak d pawn. It's unclear. Very unclear position. But I think white should be slightly better in almost all lines. 
Right. At least there you've got the pawn on F2. So you don't have the problem with your king and, and, and you've got this nice light sword bishop you wanted. Right. But I'd say black's still in the game that way. That's that's uh, probably still borderline playable. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's one of those positions where you get into an end game. You may even lose your D pawn, but hope the double F pawns don't come to really hurt you. Yeah. So there's another end game that I'm going to throw us to real quick. Nihal Sarin okay. with the white pieces against Haruchan uh, Barsigian because Nihal yeah. Sarin's position looks amazing. Ooh. Ooh. Love that kind of thing. Yeah, just... The... Look at all those doubled pawns, and his position is still good. This is the second time today we've seen the C3, D4, um, C5 pawn structure, and it looks very good for the player with the white side because it's a clamp, right? This pawn C5 shuts down the C file. You can't put a rook or a king to D6. The B6 square is just, you know, white for the taking. Bishop A4 comes to mind as a way to just pin this knight on C6 and maybe even take it so you win the A pawn. I don't see where black gets the counterplay. Yeah, he's definitely, we're not seeing any counterplay at the moment. That's not, uh, that's not evident. No black pieces attacking anything. And maybe white can just go king g2, king g3, king f4, bring this king into the game. It just, yeah, looks, looks pretty nice. <sighs> so there's yeah. so many games going on. I th I'm, the game between Oparin and Mikatarian. That's a Haik Mark Tirosian with the white pieces. I think he's just winning Ooh. against White's, Grigor. White's Pine. really getting in there here. Yeah, this looks really, really bad because uh -oh. the D7 knight is pinned to the queen and yeah. it's already up threatening to win it. If you go bishop E8, that throws the, the D5 square, <laughs> bishop D5 check, winning the rook on B3. So all of black's pieces are misplaced and black is down a pawn. In fact, the last move, the last moves were bishop B7 to win the C pawn. And then queen takes a7 after rook takes b3. So he, after bishop e6. <laughs> so white white was tying him up while t while moving his pieces onto pawns. Yes. So knight d5 the here. Best way to do it. Right. Isn't knight d5 just knight d5 can't be taken. <laughs> I queen. I guess queen got to go somewhere bad, and then what? You're gonna play knight b6. <laughs> maybe you'll go queen a3 with some hopes of queen rook a3. g3 check, and maybe, maybe, maybe you can land some kind of perpetual by doing this. That would be quite the save. I mean, rook g3 check, white would probably have king f1 in a lot of situations. But the question is, after knight d5, queen a3, what's white's next move exactly. to try and break through? Because knight b6 removes your queen from the defense of the king side, so then rook g3 check does look very good as a way of just, like, putting pressure on this white king. And if you're king f1, I take on h3, and all of a sudden you have to worry about your king's safety. So, mm -hmm. so knight d5, maybe you could... Throw your knight back to e3 instead of going to b6 in a line like that. But, yeah, that's queen a3. Does white need to do anything other than a6 here? Does white even need to try and, like, knock black out in the king in the middle? Like, is it enough to leave every black piece unable to move and just play a6? And Well, queen c7 was a good start for that. I mean, you, you make a great point. a6 coming, a7, protected square, a7, then a8. Yeah, mm -hmm. this looks... Sometimes you don't need to work too hard to win pieces that can't move, right? right. Just... But it's so tempting, right? It's a pin piece. It looks like you're just gonna. I know. You're just gonna crush them. But sometimes <laughs> yeah. patience is a virtue that should be, you know, should be utilized. And it's here, queen c7, nice move, frees up the a pawns, roaming squares, and okay, there's still all these pins in action. Yikes, 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 yikes. Um, yeah. So what's coming? Rook a3. <clears throat> rook a3. Then. I'm just trying to prevent a6 at least. I still have it also gets my rook off of those checks with my king, so. Right. But rook a3, I'd probably still go knight d5. Okay. Because I really would be happy for you to take me on d5, just so I'm going to mm. put even more pressure on the d file. Right. And your queen is nowhere useful to go. You need to protect your rook on b d8 still. So on knight d5, I play queen to f8. Ugh. And then I go knight, <laughs> knight b6. Knight b6 anyway. Uh, yeah. That, that's, uh, that's a sad life indeed. Yeah. All right. Good enough. Good enough. Okay. Feeling pretty. Feeling pretty tough. That's a big win for Armenia because obviously Grigory Oparin is a known force on chess.com yeah. and in speed chess format. So that'd be really good. And by the way, the standings weren't updated, so maybe we should take a second to just like say what's going on here with the standings because this is bunched up. We've got five teams within one and a half points. Wow. Uh, you know, and there's 24 bonus points for the team that finishes in first place. So the difference, you know, between scoring one point more or less in this 
matchup or in this in this tournament is going to be pretty huge from what we're seeing so far. Yeah, and I'm looking you know, over here with Armenia tied with Mumbai at the top with 10, but it's still very close. The blitz streams led by Jan Christoph Duda are making a comeback here. They have eight and a half points. Volga, nine. Uh, Delhi, nine. So, yeah, things can flip very, very quickly in these kind of tightly contested battle royales. All right, so chess games, chess games, chess games. Where to go? Duda has Duda has sacked an exchange. What do you think of his chances at this point? He is has sacked or lost. You know, I yeah, mean, I don't does, know. Let's, maybe let's see. Maybe Gupta did it to him. Well, he, after Queen e7, Knight d4 was a good move not to trade the queens, and then he left that pawn e6 for a while before right. taking it back. He'd rather be down a pawn for a while. Oh, he blundered. And go straight into the endgame. That's why he blundered. He went rook e7, thinking yeah. that, okay, you can't take my rook on f8 because then you lose your rook in e4. And c5 happened. And you definitely yeah. don't want to take b takes c5 and totally ruin your pawn structure. So he took with the, okay. the knight on e6. But bishop, but bishop c5, knight c5 loses a piece. Exactly. So that's even worse. So he went. Oh, c5 was such a nice move for white. Yeah. Brilliant. And He'd rather sack an exchange than take the bad pawn structure with pawn takes c5 and white can go, you know, f5 and rook a1 and just do everything. And, I mean, look at this position here. White has a three-on-two majority on the king's side, which means you'd love to play g4, g5 very quickly. And, okay, h4 was needed because the pawn was hanging on h2. But, okay, h4, g4, g5. But at the same time, black can just sit this pawn on a3 and this bishop. You know, bishops are worse in terms of value than rooks. But in certain endgames... They're so useful because it defends yeah. a3 and stops the queening square of f8 at the same time. Whereas some, yeah. a rook, for example, would have to be on f1 to do the same thing. It just, you know. Yeah, it's it's specifically end games with sort of a pawn race where each side has passers on different sides. The bishops are just the best. Yeah. They're like as good as rooks in a lot of those positions. And I feel like Gupta outplayed Duda a little bit in that in that middle game section and that nice move c5 he had the advantage but now i feel like somehow duda's back into this yeah i agree completely and actually c5 b4 comes to c5, mind c5 b4 yeah i mean those pawns are rolling those, those yeah, pawns are no are. joke and that bishop i mean it's very important another thing that bishops do better than rooks is that what there's c5 when pawns he thought about it for a while i think he was worried about rook to d1 i think that's the move you have to like really yeah. really check before you get rid of the sort of the pawn anchor for your bishop right and also yeah rook d1 with ideas of not only putting pressure on the bishop on so rook d1 if you're forced to play rook a6 then rook g4 yeah. comes and you lose g7 so yeah, you're definitely right that rook d1 has been the idea he's been considering uh, but what i was going to say is that bishops can help pawns on adjacent files whereas rooks cannot really do that very easily so the, the bishop can help the pawn on b4 and also the pawn on c5 and then the pawn on a3 just literally by how they they move whereas rooks don't always have that same access to pushing pawns forward they go well behind pawns but not um you know, push them simultaneously necessarily yeah this is feeling good for black to me i those pawns look so good what's going to happen pawn to a3 rook to e3 pawn to a2 yeah yeah, can you just push? Like, he, he went b3. Push the other one. Yeah, you can't take because of b2 and bishops covering b4. Yeah, Rook that's a7, really nice. a7, check, king to c8. b2, rook check, and then you can you can choose yeah. between king c6 or king c8, but king c8 looks better, and then you're not stopping me from queening. Nope. Okay, so he can't take, so these pawns are coming quickly. Should just be losing, I guess. I think the, so. The one thing, David, that I, I always tell people to look out for this. I see a dark square bishop. I see a light mm -hmm. square corner on h1. That right. if I can, you know, sacrifice my rook for that pawn, that last pawn yeah. there, then I would be able to make a draw by trying something f6. Right. There's a very good chance that if you could sack a rook and trade a rook, that you could hold this. But I don't think he's going to have very good chances to do that. Yeah, it's not looking... Well, yeah. I mean, B2 comes next. It looks like he's only going to get one pawn per rook, yes. is what I'm trying to yes. say. This is No, this is winning for Duda. And Duda is just... Wow. He's on fire right now. 
He, yeah. he beat Vidit. He's going to beat Gupta. He's playing real well at the right time for the Khan Blitzstreams. Yeah. On the other hand, I think the rest of his... Wait, what is this move? I think the rest of his team may have may have lost the match. Isn't Bishop e5 the, just winning on the spot? Maybe not because Rook back to d1 check, but look, feels like a good move. Because if I go b2, yeah. um, then you're going to go put your Rook on a2. It's really ugly, but at least for the yeah. moment, you can just keep your Rooks in those light squares. But Bishop yeah. e5, the yeah, Rook d1 check only move. Ugh. Okay, he went B2, and now he'll just... Yeah. He'll go rook now a. White has a chance to get two pawns for a rook. <laughs> yeah. Rook A4. Rook A4 I is say he B2 at some point. <laughs> this, is, this is really bad news. Rook A5, A4 check now. Yeah. If you go King H5, I'll go Bishop G3 and checkmate you. But that's always fun. And if you go back to H3, I'll put my rook on F4. The bishop is such a good piece in the end game. Yeah. It's you want to click over to Bakro versus Hushenbeth for a moment? Let's do it. Whoa. Where kind of, E6 where coming. They're kind of both trying to they each have like things hanging. They're trying to mate each other on G2 and G7. So E6, knight of three check or something like that? Wow, this is crazy. Yeah, it's totally crazy. But, black black could maybe play rook G3 check even. Yep. Yeah. Like E6. You go knight f3 check, you take bishop f3, I go bishop takes f3 back, but the queen f7 check. No, I can't do that. And bishop f6 mate. Yeah, so I... Hmm. Can I go... Let's see, so e6... But your rook g3 check is just... Rook g3 check is at least winning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just winning on the spot. Because you take on e1 with check, you come back and... Yeah, everything is hanging. No, this is... So that's his big threat is rook g3, huh? But I feel like if you're white, you kind of have to, right? I mean, I don't see... I guess you could go bishop well, takes... Can white G get space with bishop takes g4? Does that... But then I take back, and then I have knight f3 check coming, I think. But bishop g4 might be a better try. It's so weird because the rook on dh mm -hmm. is hanging, right? Just... It's just, yeah, it's just like completely out there in the open. It's been hanging for a bit, right? White attacked it with the bishop, black left it there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now he attacks it with his queen and bishops. So it's like double attack. Black just keeps leaving it there. <laughs> and here comes the draw. It's going to be... And here comes the draw. Oh, I'm sorry. That wasn't as exciting as I thought wait, it would wait, be. Wait. I... Knight f3. <laughs> Knight f3. Play on. Seriously. Oh, the queen f7 again. No. Queen f7, bishop f6. I'm trying to you know, have you take with the pawn. Yeah. And then I go king sure. h7. And you don't have any like checks to follow it up with. But of well, course, yeah. you, know, you, you just deliver a checkmate first. All right, so there goes that one. Okay, that's um, yeah, and uh, Gupta just resigned against Duda. Yep. So Artak Manukyan has a position where he is up a pawn, but his king is not in a good place at all. Wow, and there's a Ninja Turtle that's not on the Ljubljana team. Yeah. Ninja Turtle is Leia, Leia Garifulina. So... All right. How do you make progress here as white? Let's see. Not not by pushing the pawn. No. <laughs> C6, queen f4 is not the way to do it. Yeah, this was a dead for it. A queen centralization controls some of the squares. But now the C5 queen pawn's F, not yeah, that strong. Queen f5 queen check. F5. Okay, yeah. or not. Queen f5 check won that pawn immediately. Yeah, that would have been pretty clean. Yeah, this was just a much better square. Because now mm. you still... Now that pawn on c5 is looking a little healthier. Absolutely. And there's back rank... <laughs> a little healthier than if it were dead, I guess. <laughs> well, rook, rook, <laughs> Understatement, rook, sorry. Rook d1 is coming, right? Because you have back rank... Or rook e1 now, or rook b1. Rook b1. Like, if you put the rook on oh, b1 man, and you yeah. go for the mate on h8. Oh, no, lead your queen on c3. It was so good there, actually. It was. But okay, making some progress as well. Yeah. Where does this queen belong? I liked it on c3. Just put it back there. Yeah, just it may take six moves, but let's go back to c3. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what, what's this attempt with king on g1? I, I think he's just I trying to know. flag her. Maybe he was hoping that she would oh. flag, but. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Rook d. Rook somewhere? But she played reasonably quickly. She's going to go queen b5. Yep. 
but now rook e1 was still an option. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the king does not should not be on g1, but I like this sort no, of. No, it should be on h1. <laughs> so now play rook d1. Okay, rook f1 makes perfect sense. You're hitting f7. Not been able to predict many moves in this game. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're struggling to do that. So when is this rook going to go to the open file? Rook d1. Do it. Rook d1 is amazing now because rook d1 threatens rook d6 takes g6 with check. Okay, and it threatens rook d8. So yeah, it's rook a very d6 good wins. Time to do it. Rook d6 wins. Oh no, rook d6 queen d6. I blundered. Yeah, he's got to go rook d8 when when queen h4 no. check and queen h8 mate. Yep. Yeah. That that you're gonna predict right. I predict. Yeah. That you will. you yeah. you found the checkmate first. So. Yeah, just to show yeah. rook d6 was one of those moves that looked very good, but just blunder immediately because your queen has lost arm. I mean, rook d1 was so strong because you were threatening rook d6 and rook d8, and she prevented rook d6, but right. she couldn't prevent both. Right, rook b8 would have been the way to stop the back rank, but then rook yep. d6 comes, and your a6 pawn, your g6 pawn, all hope is lost. Oh, there's two games left. Yep, two, so, two games left. The queen ending between champ 2005 is the most interesting one. Okay, what's going on here? White's up two pawns, but... Uh, you know, got to be careful not to get perped in these end games when you're low on time. Okay, so Sedwani interesting doing well. Offered the B pawn because of Queen E4 to transfer to the. Uh, oh, that'd be a winning end game, and E6 also yeah. needs to be kept yeah. under control. Maybe Queen to D5 here. Yeah, doesn't really do much, but threatens Queen H5 with a big threat. Yeah. Okay, so king over. This position should be h5. Just go uh, h5 there, look good. Go back and play h5. He's going to do that. Oh, yeah, h5 is a very nice move. There it is. Oh, yeah, he did it just like you wanted. I, I, you know, he repeated to gain a little more time. That's not really why he did it, but I'll pretend like that's why. <laughs> but Raunik Sedwani has just been a monster. And is black just going to lose on time here? Queen c No, maybe not queen c5. Yeah, Sadwani has three points, but the biggest monster so far is Shan Sargisian on board three. He is living up to his reputation. Yeah, he's he's Can this pawn go all the way. Queen C seven check, Queen E five check. Trying to stop it. Queen C seven. Just trade Queens. Queen C seven to E five. Whoa, why'd that king go there? Queen C seven. Oh I don't know. Queen B one, where's he headed? I don't know, but it's not looking good. Oh. Anything can happen. Queen G six. Wait no nope. wait. What? What is he doing? No! Why, why, why C1? What was that? He just gave up the pawn. I told you anything could happen. Yeah. <laughs> that's, the only, that's the only really safe prediction. What just happened? Whatever happens, then you say, I told you anything could happen. Yeah. Oh my In God. fact, he allows Queen H5 mate. King H6 point. would have been a good move. He actually. Ha I know. Like just to threaten Queen H5 mate. Yeah. So Queen A1 check, King G6. I mean, how is he expecting it? Queen E5. Put the queen in the second. Queen endings are tough, but this is this is pretty weird. Yeah, some of queen what's happening e5 here. is coming. Well, now queen d5 stops it. Ah, oh, queen c3 check. You can't go to e5 because then queen d1 check at least forces a draw. I want a checkmate. Actually, queen that was mate. One no, that would have been mate. I'll show that after. It would have been a, a blundering into a checkmate. So, like if you move your queen somewhere silly, queen d1 check with the king on g6 would have led to mate. Okay, queen c. Queen c3, queen d3, queen d4. Queen, uh, queen b2. I actually don't know how. Probably to, a threefold repetition by now. <laughs> queen d1 check coming. Okay, let that queen. So I don't like what black just did because now. F5. Now F5. Another repetition. He should have played F5. Oh, f5 was a nice chance. Uh, g4, queen h2? Yeah, that would, nope. that would have been a, a nice little blunder. <laughs> I think he's just nervous in the time trouble. Yeah. They like, keep playing fast moves, like hoping to have a little more time on your clock, but... But then you realize you're not actually playing that fast. Yeah, you're not playing that much faster than the two seconds. Queen b2 check. Okay, this is just... We've seen this position many times, I feel like. Many times. If, if either player clicks on draw, it's probably probably been that 
So queen. I mean, that position with the king on g4 and queen on d5 and queen on e3, that one we've had four times, I think. <laughs> this has been a, Hard to keep this track has been a very upsetting endgame to follow. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because th there was a pawn on h7 to start, right? Everybody else is waiting to play, too. Yeah. I'm waiting just to not look at this position anymore. King h4. <laughs> play for a win. That's the fifth time they had that position. This is unbelievable. Okay, the king's going to h3. Put your king on h3. Play queen somewhat. Okay, g4. No more potential All right. repetition. There. Now now we could get a checkmate. Come on up to h4. Oh, now there's the contact draw, so you might... Yeah, queen e1 check. might be done with this now with queen e1. Queen b1 check after king d3. Uh -huh. Yeah, I called it the sundial the other day. I don't even know if the windmill... The windmill is something different, so I think it's something like the sundial. The windmill's already been taken, so yeah, you gotta name it after something else. Yeah, but you just continue to check. There it is. Okay, this game, and it's gonna kick me out of the game because the next round will start. But somewhere yeah. where there was an H pawn, I mean, this is. It's gonna take you a while to get back. To I, I, I found it. So queen oh, c7 good. check on move 72, forced king h8, and then queen e5 check forced the queen trade, and that was winning on the spot. So, unfortunately for Radix Sadwani, he could not find it in his time trouble. He clearly was playing shaky, nervous chess. And that was a, you know, a big problem. So, couldn't yeah. find it. I'll pull up all the yeah. scores here from... Yeah. This is not a replay, Gaussian Eliminator. This is live. This is the third Battle Royale of the Pro Chess League for the week. And next round, hopefully should be underway any second. What are we on? Yeah. The fifth round? I don't even, I've lost track. You know what else was good on move 71, queen to c3 or b2 check? Oh, yeah. Because of that king g6, pretty there's good, queen, right? queen g7 so mate. You get g7 with your queen. Yeah. So you force the king away from defending your pawn. Yep. King would have to go this way, and then you give the... Ch yeah, that would have been... A nicer way to do that as well. Okay, kid is 13 years old. I don't know if that actually makes me want to give him a break or if, like, <laughs> because he's so young, he should have better blitz skills, right? You want to give him some, some tough love? Be like, come on, kids are supposed to be good at this stuff. 100%, right? It's like play a pesky child who just is very fast. It's sort of it's the expectation these days. Okay. Nobody's running away with board one yet. Duda has three and a half. Vidit and Andre can have three. Duda's up against Loic Van Welly this round, who has two and a half. Okay, so let's pull up Duda's game. Oh, Van Welly's holding on to that pawn. Oh, this is going to be a fun one. This is going to be a fun one. So, yeah, Duda... Like your pawn is mine. He's the leader. Manu David Suthandrum for the Delhi Dime has dropped a three out of five, which is mm -hmm. shocking because we saw him jump onto a hot start. And his live rating is so much higher than everybody's. But it's really about Shant Sargisyan, four and a half out of five. He is yeah. the leader of this battle royale. Yeah. By a full point, right? Nobody else even has four points on any board. Uh no. Well wow. yeah, he's got four and a half and nobody else has four, it looks like. So Yeah. It says apparently Roundex said one he narrowly missed his GM norm in Gibraltar yesterday. Ooh. That stinks. I'm sorry. He'll get it. I'm not too worried about him. He's a young, young kid. Yeah. And okay, so I see people talking in chat. What's the format? Ten minutes is with two second increment is the time control. And the format is there are eight teams. You play all of the same board for the other teams. So if you're board one, you play board one from all other seven teams. If you're board two, you play board two from all the other teams, etc. All right. We're getting some... Is this, a, is this a real opening between New Tie 4 and Mickey Tarion? New Tie 4 and Mickey Tarion. Let me find... Is this an actual thing? Whoa, what? <laughs> or did they just decide to... Okay, it's from a Ross Throw Limo. the in the air and see where they fell on the board. <laughs> okay, I mean, it does make sense from the perspective of Marty Rosen with the black pieces here, because this way there are no attacks. The whole point of playing knight g5, and then mm -hmm. just immediately putting your knight back to h3 so you can go castle, f4, f5, and just break open the position. 
But by playing queen mm -hmm. h4, you're saying, well, f4 is harder to play, and if we trade queens, we're in an endgame where black has the two bishops and may not be too worried about um, getting in harm's way. Ooh, e5. He's trying to say that knight on h3 is going to be a problem. Yep, because d6 comes, uh, and then... Yeah. This... So, like, if you castled here to unpin the f-pawn... Then d6. Because you're like, I got to play f4, and then black plays d6. I was already, like, lost or something? Looks, I mean, it's... It looks bad. <laughs> Looks real bad. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you had to take on h4 and enter like a slightly better end game or something like that, but if you don't know the line, you're very concerned to do that. You see the two bishops, you see the open b file, you're saying, okay, I can't just trade into an end game, I gotta play for this attack. That was the whole point of your knight mm -hmm. was on f3 before, now it's on h3, you gotta play f4, but you don't look like you're yeah. in time, and I just like black's position, honestly. Yeah, it looks like white's last four moves don't amount to any improvement in his position. If anything, a disimprovement. Yes. It, that's bad that's bad this early on to have like three or four moves and then your position is worse than it was before not to mention anything your opponent's done to improve their position and everything that black has done is completely logical right queen h4 offering a queen trade e5 so you can expand the center make f4 more difficult to play play d6 to open up your light square bishop this looks like a very nice opening for marty rosian here so who else is having a nice opening i see the game between uh Polish fight, okay, that's still Duda and Venueli. This is going to be an yeah. exciting one. Oh, yeah, he's coming with E4. Can we just take a moment to appreciate the bit, the pawn on B7 with the pawn on A6, with the pawn on B5, C6, D5, and C4? <laughs> you know, it's not every yeah. day you get six pawns on that no. side of the board. It's very nice. Very nice. And already white threatens to win back a pawn, so let's say I play H6. Never play this move, but if I take, pawn take, <laughs> I play pawn take C4, and you can't take with this D pawn because there's a pin on the D pawn on the long diagonal. If you take with the B pawn, for starters, I can take on C4. I can also throw in moves like rook to B1 to put pressure on your bishop on B7. Mm -hmm. So bishop D6 played. Um, so now how to continue. Okay, took on D5. So if bishop E5 is to play rook E1. Mm -hmm. Looks quite logical. You can also just take yeah. on e5, right? Like pawn e5, pawn d5, bishop a3. This looks pretty miserable for black. Yeah, that's a nice thing to throw in, that bishop on a3. Absolutely. You're never castling. Maybe if you take on e5, black just castles. But then I'm going to go d6. and I think... Yeah, you will. It's going to be hard <laughs> you to never get control of those dark squares. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is not a fun position to be playing for Van Willey. No, it looks like pretty tough. Uh, G Jizu RR, I was just saying in that position, H6, you know, just because Ooh. it would have been very slow. That's all. Look at that. He doesn't even prevent him from castling. He says, please, castle. Yeah, this is problematic. You castle. Do I play bishop H6 and win your exchange? Because you have to go G6, mm -hmm. stop mate, and I can take your rook. Or yeah. do I play bishop G5 and try to go bishop F6? Probably bishop H6. Actually. Actually, bishop g5 looks even better, yeah. <laughs> well, bishop g5, you could play queen d7, perhaps, and try to trade queens off. That's ah, the... filthy. Yeah. So I think bishop h6, just the... Sometimes the easiest move is best. Right. Yeah. It's just a shame when you want to do something fancy. Yeah. Also, even if I don't have, like, a mating attack, I can play pawn take c4, and then just play rook b1, and just make all these normal moves that make... Oh! Oh! <laughs> 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 like right now i would play bc4 for sure BC4, for sure open anything here play rook d1 as one of my many good looking options and just come out for the d5 pawn queen takes c4 is a threat after rook d1 rook b1 the bishop a3 check this looks this is this is amazing e6 amazing. not even necessary but likely still a very good move. wow I'm shocked that he didn't just like auto trade on C4 before doing whatever else he wanted to do. I agree with you. Whoa, uh, Knight C6. What if, I would go Bishop A3 check, then take on F7 with check, then Queen F5 check, and lead to some kind of mate. <laughs> now he takes on C4. Okay. Yeah, because if D takes C4, you still are gonna have problems on this diagonal. And Bishop A3 yeah. check is still coming. Now, this is yeah. This is really bad. This is losing. So, dude, yeah. dude is it's, a beast. It's, it's got to be losing. 
Duda's got to be losing. Duda is an absolute monster. I actually just see Tom Haas once say, Duda is too much. It's a great way to, <laughs> to sum that up. Um, someone said knight e5. The problem with knight e5 is you attack my queen, but I just move queen f5, and I attack your knight back. f7 is a problem. d5, pawn. Bishop a3 yeah. check is coming. Everything is an issue. I mean, on knight e5, he doesn't even have to move his queen either because he's got bishop e3 and pawn takes f7. Yeah, it's probably a good, throw this, throw, a good line there. Throw in a series just of checks. Check checks. This is not Get the time to win the pawn on d5 as well. Is it too early for Lokvin and Willie to resign? That's the real question. Yeah. It's a team event, man. If, if I were playing and my teammate was like, oh, my position's bad, I resign. But, Come on, but doesn't it you... lower team morale in a sense to see a position like this? To see it? Like just no, because at it. when you're playing your game, you're not that carefully watching all the other boards, right? But you may like have a thing where you can see like results pop up for your team. If you're following them, you can see like we lost or whatever, just the result on the board. Right. Yeah. I, I think you got to keep it going in a team. Just, a team that it hurts the it hurts to see though. It really does. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm just okay. Vidit, I see his game against Hushinbet. No, okay, yeah. this game we might get back to, but it looks over. And I look at a position. I'm going to flip the board so we have from the perspective of Hushinbet. Oh, Hushinbet has another great position against another 2700 with his pawn on d5. Yep, and it's funny because it's like one of those positions where it looks like the pawn on h2 has just been thrown off the board. Yeah. Right. Like. Where's that pawn? Yeah. But you do have an even number of pawns to begin with, five on five. That pawn d5 looks great, but sometimes I'm concerned if I just blockade it, like if I put bishop d7, then yeah. just play it, put b6, you're not getting c5 B6. in. And without this h pawn, sometimes your king can feel a little bit iffy. But without the h pawn as well, yeah. maybe white can go queen f6 and try to use it to his advantage. Yeah. Yeah, it's not so it's not so easy to play this kind of position for white because it's so easy for those pawns to get blockaded. Exactly. I I wouldn't be super confident yet with white here. If you're looking at maybe queen b4 to get control of some of those to maybe put the pawn on d6. Yeah, queen b4 looks reasonable. I'm thinking for black, you can always try some queen f4 stuff just to yeah. get a counterattack going. Right. You really want yeah, that. Yeah, it's like if I commit the queen to those blockades, then maybe you just counterattack. Yeah. And especially without the H pawn, there's so many checks that I'm going to have on your king. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Not not, not the most. I, it looks so ideal, right? When you look at the position, pawn d5 has to be good for white. And the more you start like thinking about it, you let the position stew in your mind. Okay, we got to go over to Sean Sergissian's game because I see his last move is. Yeah. All right. Oh, knight of six check. What was that? He went knight of six, takes, and bishop takes f6. His queen is hanging on b7. But the problem is you right. take my queen, I take on e5, and you're losing your knight or your rook on h8. Right, and then black has knight c2, bishop h8, and black's still down to bishop. Right, at the end of this, you take one of the rooks, and then I take back, and I'm up a piece. So this way, it's sort of like an exchange sack, but not like a good one. <laughs> More like an exchange, like you lost something. Well, queen b6, for example, would probably not be a good move here. Queen b4 is a check, so that's yeah. definitely a good move. Because knight f... <laughs> what happened? Oh, I just like, you're like, it's a check. It's, it's definitely <laughs> a good move. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Uh, it's got to be good, man. He found check. <laughs> I'm just worried because knight f3 check is a counter yeah. shot for black. So by Can I play rook eighty one here, or does knight f three beat me? Knight f three check is what's really annoying. But so you might have I take it and then what? No, you're right rook though. Knight f three. I'm I'm trying to counter mate quickly. Yeah. As you're too smart here. Bishop g two comes, and then you're having queen b eight check, queen d six. Yeah. Oh look at you, always on the attack. Yeah, rook eighty one should be good then. Okay. Yeah, it was just like it's an. It's annoying to stop, you know, knight c2 and knight f3. So rather than trying to cover everything with a move like queen c3, I look for a move like rook d1 and try to play queen b8, queen d6, queen d7. Yeah, queen c3 has played rook g8, and I guess now even king h1 or rook e3. Probably rook e3 just to... There it is. Yeah. King h1, queen f2. Ah. If black could get away with that, it would be annoying that... Yeah. That they chipped away at our pawn cover. Yeah, rook e3 is just much smarter and safer. Then they can go for knight f5, knight g3. Oh! You you're just all on the the attack. Here. This is all stuff I've lost to when I was like trying to convert positions where I had an extra pawn or two. Like people have done all these things to me. 
Yeah, totally understandable. Also, going over to another Armenian game, Artak Manukyan yeah. with the black pieces. He is simply... Posting up on A2 again. <laughs> yeah, he's up a piece, and this bishop is going to come to C3 to win some more. So knight takes B4, right. just wins on the spot. Yep. I'm with you, man. Throw this Manukian. Yeah. These eagles, man. They're, they're, they're champions. They're champions in their hearts. Yep. So this is... I have this theory that some people just expect that things are going to like work out their way and other people are like waiting for something to go wrong. Yep. And the Eagles are basically, they're like, we'll win somehow, right? Bad position. Like, well, the guy might blunder. There's still some, <laughs> there's still some, some swindles left. Yeah. This is just over on this one. And Mickey no swindles left for Loic though. He lost this game before move 20 as you were kind of expecting it didn't sad sad final position as well here just you're up a pawn in the final position but you resign because you're getting mated from every direction yeah and right it's like the threat looks like it's to take your knight on e7 that's undefended but actually white will just play queen e6 mate <laughs> if, you, if you move so it's so not sad. even your biggest problem yeah so i'm going to tune back into hushinbeth and vidit because yeah. That game has that pawn has gotten oh, to d6. He did play the queen b4 move, I was thinking about. And oh no, he played queen to d4, not b4. But he still played d6 and got the exact position I had calculated with the queen on b4 or right. black trades on c5. Yeah, I think this at least got his bishop open, but now he's struggling with this pin. Yeah, f5 was a big threat. Wait, actually, f5 still might be good because you don't want to put your bishop on d5 or you lose d6. Yeah. So there it is. Yeah, all this was done to try and get some space for the bishop, but it's not working out. All of a sudden, I like Vidit's position. Yeah. Bishop yeah, B1. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that poor bishop. I mean, can I just go rook B8 and then try to go rook B6 or rook B2? You can probably do anything if my bishop's on B1, right? Yeah, strategically, it's awful. <sighs> I would go yeah, rook B8. I guess king F6. How can you complain Take about another the open file? Just collect them all. <laughs> collect the open files. <laughs> collect the second rank. Yeah. Ugh. It's like pass go. Instead of getting some money, you just get an open file. So yeah. It just looks awful. It oh, does look Although awful. rook d5 for white can be a potential way to win the c pawn. And you give up your passer, but at least you're sort of tr making a trade that might help your bishop out, I guess, is the essential point. Yeah. And I also want to thank uh, Patrick G.A. in the chat. I saw you s saying that I suck at chess, so typically not much interest. It's the commentary that got me to watch. Well, we're glad to be here. We're glad to help you improve. This is edutainment. And I, yeah. I think um, David and I are just trying to bring you, well, there's a lot of quick games going on, but we're also trying to give you instructive points along the way. So. Yeah. So I think that Vidit might have had your idea in mind that if Rook D5, he wanted to play Rook E5. You know, just limit counterplay, centralize his king. Yep. But this rook so. d5 idea is not going away. So if you play rook b8, I can still play rook d5. Ooh, bishop c6. Stopping rook d5. That's the good news. Mm -hmm. The bad news is that pawn at some point might push its way to d7. Though if it goes there, I'll yeah. just go rook d8 and swarm it. Yeah. I think whatever happens, it looks like he's leaning towards rook d8 instead of rook b8. Like he just wants to wrap this pawn up, I think. Yeah. Nice. Maybe yeah. I was just saying. I was just thinking. Maybe he's gonna go like rook e two or rook e one or something. Like trade a rook, so that he can use his king to attack the pawn. Right. Because as you were just pointing out, that you would like to instead of having played rook e two, play rook d eight, and after rook d one, play king e five. But then I can always throw in a check, and so your king has to go back. So by trading off yeah. uh, a pair of rooks, you get the e file for your king successfully. And in fact, sometimes this king might just walk its way down to c3, right, via d4. Yeah. Maybe even trap the bishop, like trap him by himself back there. <laughs> yep. All right, so here he could trade rooks, play rook e1, king f2, rook b1, then white plays d7, and he has to sack the piece back. So white should go to h2 with his king to not lose the pawn on a2. Right. So king here. I don't even know if black wants to go for that. He might just want to play like king e6 here. Yeah, because the end of that line, you lose either h7 or a7 for black, and that's yeah. not really the ideal situation. You may go up a pawn in the rook in the game nonetheless, 
and he went yeah. king e6, and now rook d8. So he's just going to try to win the pawn and go into a bishop endgame because this bishop on b1 has nowhere to work with. The move rook d8 here sort of plays itself. He might play king d7 and then go rook e6, but okay, rook d8, of course. Yeah, rook d8. Yeah, I mean, an important thing to know, like, when you're playing these kind of endgames is always, like, which endgames do I have the best winning or drawing chances in for either side, right? And for white, your best chance is in a rook endgame. That gives you your best drawing chances. And for black, the bishop ending looks best, so. Yep. Can black play f4 here? Is that advised, or what would, what would you ask him to do? Play where? F four, you said. F four. Is that is that something you can do? Yeah, that looked all right. But I mean, he just, I guess he just wants to go for the pawn. And now this pawn g four. The black king can go to f six and g five. Uh huh. He's got enough. Whoa. He's got enough with one extra pawn and this target. Whoa! Punch. That was a weird decision. But he also has no time, yeah. right? Hushin Beth is twenty seven seconds left. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not. Yep. I can already see the end. King e five. Bishop d seven. Bishop f five. That's Bishop d7 to f5, yep. Looks like the end is near. All you do, you need is a real pass pawn. This h pawn is not actually passed because for those of you, some people may not even know the en passant rule, but if you move twice, on the my pawn is on the fit, my fifth rank, I could take en passant. So that's an important thing to remember because I think for less experienced players, you forget that that's a thing that can happen. Oh, is he zugzwanging him? <laughs> G8 is a classy square to zugzwang him on. I, I approve. Like, you could play A6, you could play A5, you could play Bishop F7. He's like, I'm going to go tuck this away on the worst square on the board, and it's still zugzwang. Yes, because the bishop needs to stay protecting the C pawn and protecting the F5 square so my king doesn't come. The king on E3 needs to keep my king out of D4 and F4, and then the only square I can do that from is E3. So now bishop takes C4, gobbling up a pawn. King f5 now, you want to... King f5 also. Yeah, this is just... He won. Nice. Yeah. That was really, really nice. Instructive. Yeah. Uh, Vidit played that very, very well controlled. You know, no no hope was given. Yeah. Oh, the game between Mikatarian and Nutai, that's Jean-Pierre Leroux versus... What I just clicked on, h6. Look at that move. You, you can take the pawn, but... So just for starters, rook b6 was played. Yeah. This knight on g5 is hanging... But rook b8 is checkmate. G6, he yep. played h6, and now rook b2. Marty Rosian has done this multiple times today when he's losing. He just puts his rook under attack. So played one last. One last. You know, last ditch one last move. Like, if you pre-move checkmate, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. And we left this game thinking that black had a pretty good opening. And then we get back, and I guess Jean-Pierre LaRue handled things pretty well. Oh, yeah, actually, this was the opening we thought was kind of, like, disastrous for White. I mean, he ended up playing Knight back to G1 very early on in this game. Yeah, this was horrible opening. For, I mean, Black was amazing here. I'm on move 15 after Castle King died. <laughs> like, yeah. Black is, what, four Tempe ahead? Yeah. It looks like White didn't even try to develop. Okay, I can't... Don't... If you're in the audience, don't look at don't this look position. At this. Yeah, we don't want you to learn from this and do it wrong. No, you don't. you don't want to have something like that... Because you look at that position like, oh, if a GM did it, I can do it too. No. You develop your pieces. You cast your king. Don't do as they say, not as they do. In the game between okay. Aditya and Mittal. And That's what I want to see. Okay. White's down a pawn, but I would think that white is the one with the advantage, even down a pawn here. Yes, especially because the king, the black king, will not be in time to get back to the pawn because it can't go to the d7 square. So let's say you go bishop f5. That will lose on the spot because c6. King seven c seven and there's no way to stop me from queening my knight covers d seven square. It looks like the pieces are so. Oh no, you don't have time for that, man. Wait, what if I just take your bishop? Robert just told you the pawn was going to queen. Yeah, what if I just take your bishop? Knight g six, king g six c six, and you're not stopping that queen from happening. No. Uh, questionable decisions. I mean, even without the trade, how does black stop c six? Yeah, that's a great question, but. Yeah. Aditya Mittal coming up big. Now, this is the last dish effort. Take on g3. Black will play h3 and hope yep. that somehow white will not play, white doesn't king, play f3. king f3. Exactly. <laughs> so this is winning for Mittal. I see the game between Gupta and oh, Ganguly as well. Oh, Ganguly just lost. And that was a really... I, I got to show that because I just hovered over the game. Jonas Lampert okay. put that king on h4, went g5 check, and if you take on h5... Knight f4 check comes on the board, winning your rook on d5. So a tough go of it 
for Ganguly in this particular wow. game. Wow. That's a nice little tactic slash mating net. Yeah, that's a fun way to win. You know, not that many pawns on the board, not that many pieces, but king on h5 gets mated still. And the last game that I see here is Gupta against Andraken. That is a primetime matchup. Yeah. Even material, but white's pass pawn is definitely stronger than black's. But look at this knight come to d3, trying to hit the right. f2 pawn. So can this rook and knight generate enough of an attack? King f4. Well, he's got a one repetition. It's a good start. Nope. But wait, rook c1 check. Where's your king going? To e2. But the knight d4 check won the b5 knight pawn. Knight d4, king to d2. Wait, now knight e6. No, oh, this was... Andraken has... Not done this right at all. Go rook b1 check. Because rook b1 yeah. check... Okay, he's going there. But I, I'm still not buying this. King e, that, king e1. Just run away from yeah. your king side. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I love this. Sometimes hope is all that you got from you and me and your best friend. And Mr. Dodgy Chess says, hope chess is the best variant. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So hoping to make a, speaking of hope, hoping to make a draw here is on Draken. King H7 is mm -hmm. up by Knight F8 check. Yeah. So th there might be. He's still got a chance here. Instead of trying to defend his pawns, he's trying to trade off as many of whites as he can, which... Seems logical under the circumstances. But there might be some mating nets here. Knight h1, what a move, what a concept. Yeah. Just wants rook to before trade check. that stuff off. Wait, how, why, rook before check, won the g3 pawn. That seems like a missed opportunity. That was very solid, very solid. Because <laughs> now just rook f6. Don't go rook g5 because knight takes h3 is an important check. Oh, Ooh, wait, rook yeah, f6 that's... also, bl he blundered the h-pawn. And not only did he blunt yeah. the h he loses his knight on f3. Where's his king going to go? Oh, no. He needs to go knight, knight h4. Knight e5 here? Yeah, knight, 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 e5. knight, knight e5 or knight h4. Mo knight e5, knight d3 check? Yes, it's going to happen. <laughs> knight d3, king f5. Okay, he took the wrong pawn. Go somewhere simpler-ish. No, this looks worse. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a simpler square. Yeah. It wasn't a good one, but... yeah. Instead of winning white's material, he just took a pawn. Okay, so go. And now this goes on. Go rookie seven. Try to play for a win. Rookie seven. Protect your knight. You can't win something like this, no. can you, with just one pawn left? No. I mean, you could maybe get to rook and knight against rook and play that for a few moves. I would, well. I would play that forever, not just a few moves. Forever and ever and ever. Okay. King g4, and then rook takes e5, and we're in a theoretically drawn position. Yeah, you can't win with the g pawn. Gupta offers a draw. He knows it's like. There's no possible way that Black can lose to the G-Pawn. Oh, my goodness. Robert, as we were watching there, I forgot that these guys were like, that Black was 2,700. <laughs> I totally <laughs> forgot. When I saw those blunders, I thought it was a board four. <laughs> I mean, it, it, they got down to time trial, missed like everything down the stretch. <laughs> yeah. But it was a... That was some chaos. Yeah. That was some chaos. Knight h1, though. Like, that's a move you don't see every day. That was pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, you should see when I'm down to my increment, you know, not to insult these guys. When I'm down to my increment, like, you would think it's, like, you know, players who just, like, learned to play last week. Yeah. Because I'm just like, ah! <laughs> yeah, for sure. And here, I mean, this knight takes h3, missing knight d3 check. Just earlier, missing some stuff, too. So it was a funny little back-and-forth game here. But ultimately, a draw felt like a fair result, I guess. I don't know. I'm just trying to be fair. I'm going to pull up all the individual boards. So Gujarati has four. Duda has four and a half. They're the leaders on the top board. Uh, yeah. SL Nara uh, Narayanan has four and a half for Delhi. So he's okay. The, so he's by far the leader on that board. Yeah. Shant Sargisyan, five and a half out of six. Still scoring. And Raunek Sedwani also doing impressively with four and a half. He's the one who missed that Queen end game that we were upset about in the mm -hmm. previous round, but yeah. he's doing very well with four out of six. And then on board four, Aditya Mittal, Manu David, Suthandram, and Kevin Bordy have four, but it's yeah. board three and four of Armenia are leading their charge. They're still not in first place. Second Kevin, place. Kevin must be on a good streak. I feel like at the beginning, he must have lost one of his first two games, and he was never like in the lead for board four. And now, look at this, four points. <clears throat> yep. And interestingly enough, 
I'm seeing only one person with one point. That's Nicholas Hushenbet, a very strong grandmaster, but just goes to show yeah. the kind of opposition he's been facing on that top board, where you know you can be nearly 2,600 feet a and be one point out of six games. Yeah, I mean Berlin. Berlin likes to play this very balanced lineup, right? Yeah. Um, that's. I mean, I think they've done so almost like every round is like, you know, they're playing 24, sometimes even 2,400 on board four, but certainly on board three and 2,300 plus on board four. And I don't think they've ever played somebody over 2,600 on board one. They've never stacked things at all. Right. So good as he may be, he's frequently outrated by 100 points here. Yeah. No, it's true, which is crazy to think about because they're only, what, 250 players in the world higher rated than him. They just all happen to be playing in the Pro Chess League. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, yeah. and Mumbai right, and so Armenia. Standings. So the standings are Mumbai is half a point ahead of Armenia going into last round. So basically they've got draw odds to win this whole battle royale. Yeah. So let's go back to the big board. And then there's a small gap between them and Delhi. And the fact that they're playing each other, I think, means it's essentially impossible for Delhi to catch both of those teams, right? right? Because right. at minimum, Mumbai and Armenia has to produce one team with 18 yep. points if they draw 2-2 or Armenia scores 2.5, and, and then Delhi would have to 4-0 to get into a tie for first. Beyond um, unlikely. Yeah. The numbers do not favor that as a possibility. So we have... Okay, I have all these Armenian games up at the top here, so I think we'll just focus there. Vidit versus yeah. Avinand Jurasin, Artak Manukian versus Adityan Mittal, Shant Sargisyan playing this... Oh, Raunik Sedwani, excuse me, with the white pieces. Now, this line is hilarious. It's called the Frankenstein-Dracula variation. So first, he'd be excited about that. Yeah. Bram Stoker is stoked somewhere. And yeah. Queen H5, so you're threatening checkmate. Now, firstly, let's talk about 94 D5. That's the whole point. You sack a piece to win a piece. Sometimes you got to spend money to make money, right? That's what they say. Yeah. So queen h5, knight d6, bishop b3, knight c6, now knight b5, distracting this knight away from the f7 square. So g6 is the move, queen f3. F5 yeah. is the follow-up because you can't move your queen over to defend against checkmate without losing this pawn on c7. And f5 is the move here. Because it stops you from getting mated, but then white plays. Stops mate. <laughs> but then white plays queen d5, going for the same exact checkmate. I'm really worried for my boy Sean. Oh no, this is bad. He, I think he blundered. This knight. Yeah, I don't I'm know really this worried. knight f5 move. I think that's a terrible move because I'm positive that the move is f5, queen d5, queen f6, or queen e7. You sacrifice yep. your rook on yep. a, and you play it like I did with b6, bishop b7, and get counterplay because white is so underdeveloped and black has incredible piece play yeah. but this ugh, where's this knight going h6 ugh. d4 i i mean he just i'm really piece. worried here no he's just giving up a piece yeah. he didn't know what he was I doing mean, it was a bad sign white was threatening like he chose to play 94 and white's like threatening made him one in an opening that's you know pretty well known and he's sitting here thinking this is you know unless he was this... thinking about g6 he was thinking about knight f5 or f5 you, you know what this is to me this is like either there's some new theory that I have no idea existed where you sack a piece and just like develop quickly and say White's king isn't going to find safety, which I don't think this is happening. Or if he, he just, blitzed this out, yeah, maybe. Yeah, he just blundered. He, he didn't know the opening. Just didn't know his stuff in this game. So now let's find out what he can do down a piece, huh? You, th you, you think he, he can do it? No. I'm, no? I'm going to have a hard no on that one. Just nice C3 back. <laughs> Okay, I mean, there's still some chances, right? <laughs> because You're like, you're not going to catch my knight with a6. You're going to have to come up with something better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a one-move tactic's not happening. But... Uh, all right, I think that Shant will save the game somehow. This guy's magic. He's magic. So you believe in magic, clearly. Yeah. I'll take, I'll take a draw or a win for black, and you get a win for white. I feel like you're going to be right here, though. I'm nervous about it, because Shant's been playing <laughs> so well, and the position is not so... Like, it's up a piece for two pawns. And the problem right. is that Black's king is now safe, and White's king might not find the clearest path to safety. Anytime you move your knight from e2 yeah. to g3, you're immediately met with knight d4 opportunities. Mm -hmm. I would go bishop d5 at some point for White. There's there's nothing special going on just yet. Right. But Black's got sort of a flexible position and structure. 
Okay, bishop e3 has to be a good move. For Hasn't him. traded anything off yet. Just play bishop e3, castle queen side. I believe in Raonic Sidwani. Okay. But should I? How about the teammates? It's all about this matchup. I see the game between Marty Rosian and Ganguly looking okay. wild already. Yeah. Ganguly yeah, down you a pawn. That. <laughs> it looks like the kind of position where white gets mated and move 10. Right, because their king is here. You haven't developed your uh, light square bishop. You can't even move it because your yeah. pawns are stuck. Not only will he not move the light square bishop, he won't even move the e pawn. He's like, nope, nope. I'm a queen side player. <laughs> exactly. And queen b queen b5 looks like it wins a piece because it attacks the knight on c4 and bishop on g5 a second time, but then white will go queen a4 in response and just be like, hey, let's trade queens off the board. I'm up a pawn, and my king will be safer yeah. there. So queen b4 goes after this knight. So knight c to d2. If you go knight f to d2, you lose your bishop on g5. So if you go bishop back to d2, you lose your knight on c4. So that yeah. leaves only knight c to d2. It leaves there. only knight c d2. It took him like 30 seconds to discover it, but yeah, it was pretty clear. Black can recover the pawn they've sacked on d4 now or on b2. So yeah, d4 is the juicier one. e3. Immediately e3. And now. Developing the pieces, huh? Well, Ugh. bishop b5, queen f3 is coming. Oop. Queen f3 like, could, be, could be a problem. This is actually looking kind of nice for white all of a sudden. So what does black play? Queen f6 or something to deal with queen f3? Oh, that move, sure. Covers it too. But the problem is, if well, I. Well, that move covered bishop b5 too. It covered everything. But if I go bishop c4, you're not taking on g5 because then queen f3 comes and you're losing rook anyway on a8. Oh, no, but I need to take on g5 if you develop your bishop. I can't just let you do everything. Well, what are you going to do if you're bishop c4? I don't know. I, I mean, I have take to take G2? the knight and then queen f3, I have to come up with something. <laughs> Maybe you'll take on g2 actually. Yeah. It's a lot, you know, it's kind of a desperate, but. Uh, it seems like basically losing oh, to take on g2 so bishop e2 is probably the best move just like a very calm move going to f3 and saying i'm gonna win your rook on a8 that looks pretty well, that's that's pretty cruel <laughs> right we're like trying to come up with tactics and sometimes there's this bishop e2 move yeah so someone mr dodgy chess said computer says knight f5 is the best move in the frankenstein dracula nonsense I don't know which computer said that, but uh, check your CPU. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. I was like, what? It's like, it is Alpha Zero style, though. So, Rook C1 played by Marty Rosian. I don't know if I agree with that move. But he, he can put his Rook on C7 in some lines. And, oh, he's trying to go Bishop B7, the Queen A4 check. So, asking Black. You know, Sarkeesian did something really weird, man. He sacked a pawn in his piece down position. <laughs> e4 that seems more desperate than anything but all right okay but the knight went back to g1 which obviously is not to what... stop knight f3 that's a great move maybe yeah, no it is a very good move i agree it's just not when you think about how you want to continue the position you don't yeah. think you want to put your knight back on g1 but is that a necessity and you want to pawn the process so that looks pretty good yeah and this knight can come back to e3 to attack the bishop on g4 no, looking very good for Sudwani here. Yeah. Yeah, I don't yet see the point of this pawn sack, unless it was that he didn't see white move knight to g1, which is quite a good move. But but knight e3, bishop h5, maybe knight c4, just bishop d2 and castle. I can't castle queen side. There's a bishop covering. I just wanted to get out of there, but <laughs> but maybe knight c4. Or pawn. What is going, what is going on? How, what What's the What's the idea? What is this game? <laughs> I don't know, but King H8 followed by F5 is another pawn sack in the making. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to make it on material, so you might as well just give all yeah, of it. Yeah, make it exciting while you can. I mean, the game between Vidit and Zavin, by the way, is also really exciting because... Wow, these guys just saved all the crazy stuff for the last round against each other. Yep. So Vidit's got the knight outposted nicely. He's got an extra pawn, as far as I can count. You're counting correctly. Looking for a second one on b5. But e4 is a little weak. Yeah. Okay, b4 is a move that definitely caught me by surprise. I guess the b2 pawn is hanging now. Really weird position. Okay, my question that I immediately look at is, can I play knight takes g7? And the point is, oh, no, this doesn't work at all. Wow. 
But, I, you know, I have these ideas where I'm trying to play knight g7. But the problem is knight g7, bishop g7, rook f5, you take on f5. Because my queen is hanging on e2 in the end of those variations. Oh, man. Black gets all your pieces, unfortunately. Yeah, I'm trying to be creative. Yeah, fair enough. It is, like, sort of a creative-looking position. Someone asked, what about knight h6 check? The problem with knight h6 is this knight on f6 is enough defense, so I would just take on h6. But queen, yeah. queen c4 is a logical move. Zaven's got a bunch of pieces in logical defensive formation. Yep. But he's also a little bit tied up. Hmm. Artok Minukian, speaking of tied up, got to go to his yeah. game. He's the white pieces. Black has equal material, for sure. But I look at this position, and I see oh. the d5 yeah. square and this backward d6 pawn. Beautiful, beautiful. This is just an ideal situation for white. You can even play a5, yeah. then b4, then figure out if you want to play b5 over there on the queen side. Or you play. It could only be better if that knight transformed into a bishop, right? If it had a, a piece change operation. Here. Yeah. Yeah. This, I mean, here, though, the rook comes to d3, the other rook comes to d1. The rook from d3 will either be used to play c5. Well, c5, not yet. I wouldn't play c5 because not that allows yet. rook f to d8. <coughs> and that's a serious. You gotta be of really ready when you go for it. So I would go rook d3 and just. I don't see what black's doing, David. I mean, rook d3, rook a d1, and. A5, a useful move, but the reason why I don't like A5 is now I feel like B6 is useful for black at, at some moment. Like, look right. to B8 here to play B6 comes to mind. Or rook C8 and then move my queen somewhere and then put my rook on C6 and defend that. Maybe one. he's thinking anytime black plays B6, he can trade, and when black recaptures, play C5 and just nail him. Yeah, that's true. I guess that's why rook right C8 there. was just played, to stop right, C5. Just bang. So rook d3 and rook a d1 maybe still, but then the problem is his queen's in front, so black doesn't need to put the other rook on d8. Huh? Right, you would love that queen to be on d1 and the rook on d5, so you have that Eljokin's gun, but here the queen yeah. is leading the way, which is a bad thing. Yeah, we should have rook on d5, rook on d3, queen on d2. Yep. What I would like most. But it looks like he's going to play king g2, h4, and try and add his h pawn to the king side. Black's going to play g6 and h5. Well, there'll be pawn breaks. He'll be able to open the king side when he wants to. Yep. That's uh more h5, lift a rook, then play g4 at some point. Yeah, maybe go for a checkmating attack because black's very tied down to the queen side. So if white can flip all the way over to the king side, there's some potential for an attack. But I think h5 is the move. I don't want to allow white to play h5. Okay, queen c5 offering the exchange yeah. also makes perfect sense. I was just going to ask you, do you think that white's holding back on rook d3 because queen c5 would sort of force the queen trade? It's, it's the last game of the year. Don't hold anything back. A nice water boy okay. reference here. But it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough to say because the end game, right? It still favors white. Still favors white, sure. So black's in play. In fact, it gets rid of the queen in front of the rooks problem. Yeah. And now, but now the king's on e7 already, which is very good news for Aditya Mittal because he defends d6 this way, can play rook c5, trying to trade off the rooks. But yes. Clearly better for white in this end game. So how are okay, Vidit's game? How are the crazier games Vidic's going? Vidit's game against Andreasen. He look at you know, Bishop C one and move twenty eight, and then Queen takes F seven check, and then Bishop back to F four, and we're here. How do I end this game? Wow, Vidit's killing it. He got his bishop out. He got his bad isolated e pawn to d six. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good pawn there. And rook a7 comes to mind to try to get this knight on d7 yeah. out the way. Wait, rook takes c5 is yeah. a tactic here as well. Rook takes c5. Rook c5. Knight takes c5, d7. d7. But the problem is you lose c2 at the end of this, and that b pawn is rolling. So I, I, you have to be careful before you do something like that. It's just an idea that you have to keep yeah. in mind. is yeah, These yeah. knights are doing very well to protect each other. And so if you can take one of them, well, then the other square is going to be vulnerable. Yeah, so let's see. Yeah. Still tricky. Bishop c6, rook f8 doesn't work, so there's another tactic to not go for just yet. Yep, but David, I'm looking at the Shant Sargissian game. Yeah, the, he successfully kept white from castling, huh? The, at least. The counterplay feels real. Does it? It does. Now it does. Like, white's just not quite untangling his pieces, huh? The queen on a6 is really annoying. And, yeah, how do you... 
fully get out of this. Maybe Rook G1. But no, Rook G1, you have Knight F3. Ugh. I mean, it's Black's move. Oh, it was Black's move. Knight F3. It, it even was Black's move. I started not liking the position for White, uh -huh. and it was Black's move to begin with. And it was Black's move, yeah. Well, Bishop C4 is an option here. And a very oh. useful one of that. C4, and then B5. Ah, uh, B5. I didn't even think about that. And then, then we give back in exchange. That might not be the worst thing. Yeah, like world. Bishop C4, B5. I'll take on G7. You take back. I'll play Bishop D3. And mm -hmm. my king feels a lot safer because your queen's not aiming at E2. Now my knight can go to G3 next. This actually looks like the way to go. Bishop C4 played. Actually... David, if you go b5, I should take on yeah. g7 and play knight g3 immediately. And just go checkmate you on the king side. So bishop, bishop g7, oh. knight g3. Now you are right. Forget about everything. Forget about your bishop. Forget about your rook. Yeah, that's actually just leading to a mating attack. Let's do it. So Will Raunek know the moment to switch from defense to offense? Yeah, bishop g7, check. He's got to find it. Take a knight g3. It's actually, when you start sitting and thinking, it makes perfect sense because this bishop on h5, you know in a structure where there's a fianchetto that the bishop is out of options. And you definitely yeah. don't want to take back on h5 with a pawn because your king will just be in harm's way. Even if there weren't a bishop on h5, like knight g3 to f5 would be like a key idea here, right? Yep. Like if we just imagine that bishop not being there. You'd still want to go for knight f5, probably. Yeah, this looks really good for Sudwani. Also, Vidit over here is winning material against Zavin Andreasin because he went for this line, rook c5. I'm kind of proud that I had seen that, and then rook c1 came because there's a problem on the c8 square at the end of this. So the movers are not wanting to surrender their lead here. Nope. They do not... Yep, and the, wow. perfect. This, this, that looks pretty over, right? The the Vidit game? Does not look very good. And the, it's time for the ambulance to come. I, see, I hear it, I see it. Wait, it's, <laughs> it's parking across the street, though. Uh-oh. Or, or is it going to flip back around to my I building? hope they didn't look into the future and see something happening to you, Robert, like some move that shocks you too much. Yeah, exactly where I need it. But I have an, my emote that's coming in right now. All right, because that'll be enough. The ambulance is here. But okay, this looks bad for Zavin. And yeah. Sean Sargis he played it. He played uh, take a knight g3, and Sargisian went knight d2 oh. check, but yeah. that doesn't feel like enough. Well, his point is he's going to go back to f3 and see if yep. if white goes to g2, he can at least take the rook with check or something before he suffers for his bishop on h5. Mm. So let's see, knight f3 check, king g2. Uh, you take my rook with check, I take back, you take my bishop, I take yours, and then queen g5 check wins on the spot because king h8, queen f6 check, king g8, and then knight f5. So it's important to throw that queen g5 because you get your queen to f6 and then just keep that king on g8 and deliver check and mate. Yeah, yeah Sadwani playing some good chess here. Yeah, he, uh, whew. Yeah, he's going to win this one. He really played this one nicely, actually. It was not so clear how to do this for white. Yep. Yeah, this is a really nice play, actually. I honestly, I mean, okay, the opening was very strange by Sargissian giving up the piece because he didn't know it. And now Sadwani handled the complications very well. And let's see how Vidit, because I see a queen for Vidit and none for Zavin. I think this is the best yeah. chance for Andreasen. Let's just trade on C1 and... Okay, so rook c3 now? Yeah, I hope that white didn't have enough to come up with the winning plan here. Well, normally you, you'd want to play b3, but the problem is after b3, you take, yeah. oh, not b, take on b3, you take the rook, and then after b2, you bishop e4, just the right moment, covering the queening square. Yeah. But that is an idea you certainly have to keep in mind because black would love to push this pawn to b3. Yeah, vid is just in time covering the square. Whoa, so I'm guessing when f5. That is a desperate move. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you had to keep the white queen out of f6. I'd, I'd considered this move. It's. But if you blunder here with queen g5 and then rook g8 happens and you're very sad. Yeah. So don't play queen g5 with your king on g2, but you could play queen h6 here. Or bishop a2, mm -hmm. I guess, is 
That's too calm. Like I, I would never play. That's too calm. I would play. <laughs> I would play Queen H6 almost immediately. Because I thought it made sense to keep that piece. Just like go for checkmate. Yeah, I guess Queen H6. Hmm, maybe, not sure what Black's defense would have been. <laughs> maybe Queen A7 or something on the seventh rank. Something. Yeah. But then you can save your bishop by just taking on B5. True. So yeah. Oh, and so you've got a good point. Artak Manukyan is either making progress or making a draw. I can't tell yet because I see Rook C1 check and. Well, his team really needs him to score like two points this round. <laughs> this point. That would be a very great effort by him. Two points in one game. But if anyone yeah. can do it, Artak Manukyan can. Can you imagine being one of the players who loses this round for them? And then after the game, after our talk wins, you're like, dude, we needed two points from you. Why did you only win once? <laughs> yeah, that's a way to get back at your manager. Just like, Come on, dude. You're the manager. You got to do everything you can for the team. Whoa, he's giving yeah. up the C pawn, though. Trying to go over there and win the uh, kingside pawns. Yeah. But rook B1 check here, I don't... I mean, rook B1 check is just a good move. Rook B1 check is a good detail, yeah. Although rook B1, maybe king C4. King C, king C2, I think. Oh, I think king C4, because rook B4 king check, C4. king C5, and then I'm giving you a check on the... Oh, but this shouldn't work out anyway. So you're going to allow rook G4 and win just off the D pawn? Yeah, it's not going to happen. And it doesn't work anyway. Okay. So king C2, rook B4, rook G6, and then rook D4 should be more than enough to hold. Yeah, this is not... They're repeating moves anyway. Oh, yeah. Rook C1 was smart, right? Why mess with any of that? <laughs> okay. That's black. So this is a rook end game. There's no incentive. We'll let the rook end game stay put. And they're wow, the movers. Draw. The movers have done it, right? They're, they're, they got a draw in their position where they were doing badly. Marti Rosian versus Ganguly looks equal-ish. Draw-ish. I don't even need to know who's better or worse. Yeah, it's just dead draw not now. enough material for anybody to win, right? Yep. Sargisyan is should be mated soon, but he's hanging in there and trying to survive. It looks really, really, really bad. Yeah. Oh, rook to g7. Queen, What's his plan? And queen, queen e4. Or king g1. And then you lose f5 as well. Queen f5. All right. Yeah. So it's not that done yet. You know why I saw that so quickly? Why? Because I wanted to suggest the same exact line, but before I say it out, saying it out loud, I was kind of like, this doesn't look right. Uh huh. So, yeah, so F3. Well, F3, then queen back to C3, I guess, is the, the hope. Okay. Like, black is just trying desperately to get some sort of counterattack chance. Right. Uh, He's just looking for a check. He's fishing for one check. Wait a second. There's also some tactics. Like, if your queen. Okay, obviously your queen will stay on the diagonal, but like rook g8 check followed by queen f6 kind of thing. Like, I'm just trying to... F he took on f5. How does that even help? How, how could that possibly help? I don't know. It beats me. f6 here? I mean... I'm trying to trying to positionally trap the bishop, but it's a little <laughs> late for that. <laughs> yeah, you're going to get mated. But it's interesting to do that, but... Yeah, I don't see how you're stopping queen g7 check. And if you have queen c7, then rook g7 lands on the board, so... Yikes. Yeah. Well, that was pretty impressive by Sadwani this round. Yep. Um, yeah. Pretty good. The movers impressing. Um, Wait, but what's going on? Archie Rosian drew. They traded every single thing off the board did, down to Bear Kings. Did Andreasen hold here? Like, I mean, we'll, we'll go back to this other game. If it, oh, okay. Uh, so I guess I in lost. So. But Vidit against Zavin Andras, and Zavin was smart. He's just going to try to put his rook behind the pawn, like keep the rook on b8 or something. But I think mm -hmm. Vidit is going to try to go king f3, like bring the king to the b1 square. But, uh -huh. but if I go to b1, you'll probably lose the g4 pawn in the interim. So I don't know how this, exactly this is going to play out. I think the king is in time to go back. So king f2 here. Queen f2. Okay, attacking. Oh. If you go to the wrong square. So rook b8, queen, queen f4. f4 is coming. What? Nope. Whoa, what? Just repetition. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was confusing. But I think something like that is going to win at some point. You free your queen with the tempo by attacking the rook. And then you're going to be able to um, remaneuver. So king, e, king e3, king e2, kill king e2. G oh, h6 is coming. Can black not defend that? 
That was devious. Trading pawns. Vidit's down to eight seconds. I, I don't know if he knows for sure how to win this. So black takes, and then you play h6, and then black plays like rook b7 or something. What's the problem? Well, then we get queen against rook, and then that's winning, but it takes a while, right? Oh, but you're not going to take back on g7. I see. Oh, okay. This has to be winning now, for sure. Yeah. If I got my pawn on g6. I'm quite confused by what just happened, but oh. I think we're down to the the amount of time where I get confused by everything. Wait, are there stalemate <laughs> tricks though, David? Like if yeah. I just keep my rook on the eighth rank, yeah. At some point, you're going to need to get your king to f7. But I'm wondering right. if I have stalemate tricks. You you will have the crazy rook once that happens for sure. And so he's going to try to do so. Rook f8 here. Okay, so he's just given his B pawn. He's not worrying about it anymore. Don't, you, you know, you don't even have to take it yet. But okay, you're going to take it at some point. So king f4 would allow, allow the crazy rook because you need to get your queen not covering g8. That's important. If your queen's on e6, yeah. then there's all these sacrifices for stalemate. So king e4, just bring your king in. Well. But then what? Like. Even when you bring your they king, showing the heart that the uh, that these eagles have so often relied on. I don't know if it'll be enough. I actually have no idea how you win this. Does the rook run out of moves? Rook g8, queen e7. That is so nasty. If that were to happen, the the rook runs out of moves. Queen e8, queen e6, king c7. Oh my god, queen f7 is so nice. Oh, there's oh the wild god. rook. There's the wild rook. No. He put his queen on the wrong diagonal, and here comes the rook. <laughs> the wild <laughs> rook has appeared. <laughs> but king c3, then rook back to b8, only move. But Why can't he just keep checking? Because the queen... Oh, queen can't capture it. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Oh my gosh. That, yeah. That's so funny. That's frustrating for Vidit, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that's it, man. I don't know. I can't imagine where where you would go where anything would matter, right? Oh, we're saying you got to keep this queen off the diagonal. You know, I got to leave yep. the g8 square open. Yep. It's incredible. I mean, the, I mean, we should be c congratulating the movers because they won this because uh, they won this battle royale. But I feel like we still saw some of the Eagles' strong points even as they lost this match to to Mumbai. Zavin is a fighter. That is for sure. Yeah. That is unbelievable. That is such a su sweet ending. Yeah. Just check forever. Wow. This is a game I would have lost like on seven different occasions as black. Yeah. Like so many death blows were landed by Vidit in the middle game. And to like decide how much to lose at each point and then to eventually try and salvage this rook versus queen. Yeah. Oh, man. Just on, okay. That's crazy. They're going to be the last game too. Yeah. We've only watched this one match in this final round. Um, Can you believe that? That was I'm just riveted to it. That was crazy. I'm gonna pull up all the boards here because so did Mumbai win 18 to 17 and a half? Is that right? They won first barely over Delhi. Um, Delhi almost came back. It looks like. Oh my gosh! Delhi almost scored enough points to catch up with them. How is that possible? Right, because Mumbai scored the minimum two and a half. Right. So Delhi scored three and a half. That means somewhere Delhi had one draw, which if they won, they could have tied for first. But three and a half, that's crazy. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's really ridiculous. Also, credit to Volga because... The one draw that they had was Narayanan versus Jean-Pierre Larue. And Narayanan has been like a huge scorer for them today. But he didn't get the win when it mattered most, it sounds like. He is still the top board, too, with five points. Man. That was unbelievable. Like, I'm still shocked by the stalemate. I'm looking over here at the standings. Uh, sorry, the uh, leaderboard from the, the scores from this round. Uh, Mumbai scored 18 and a half. It just didn't register yet. So, it actually, they were a full point behind, which means that Delhi, had they won that game, still would not have tied for um, the first place here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, because Mumbai was already half a point ahead of the Eagles. It was, yeah. So Mumbai, it was if they got two points that they would have fairly won. But with two and a half, they're a full point ahead. Okay. So who are our MVPs? Because lots of excitement was happening. Raunik Sidwani is my MVP. I'm just going to put it out there. 
I mean, that was a great final game by him. Um, it looks like he tied Sargisian for top for top board three by beating him yep. in their head to head in the round that really everything was on the line. So that's huge. I've forgiven uh, Sadwani for missing that Queen Endgame win. Like that's that was bothering me till okay. he just won this final round, and now I forgive him. Yeah, that's yeah. You come up with that knight g three and stuff, clutch in the final round. Yeah, I think that gives you a get out of one of one other mishap. <laughs> I think he's my pretty clear MVP actually. And also, yeah. first shout out to the Mumbai Movers for winning the battle royale. But if you look across yeah. the board, all of them had plus scores: four and a half. That's plus. That's you know two more wins and losses. Four points out of seven. Five and a half out of seven, four and a half out of seven. There's no like weak link in that lineup. And also Delhi, similarly, the big difference was for Delhi, you know, on board one, right? They they kind of yeah. traded off points in the lower boards, but Vidit is just a stronger board one than Gupta, much higher rated, and Vidit, yeah. you know, showed his might today. Yeah. Still, I mean, it's it's overall pretty close, with with Narayan on performing so well. But I think also, like you could say, maybe the problem is that Nihal Sarin, who's like 100 points higher than Sajwani, um, wasn't able to outscore Sajwani. So in a sense, that also reinforces your MVP case for him, right? That like they had invested their points in Vidit. Yeah. And not having the highest rate of board three. And then, he's, and then he comes out on top, right? Yeah, so Sajwani for MVP is, that's where I'm going with it. I, I just can't. Can't think of anyone else who deserves it more. Uh, some great performances. Sean Sergisian, if he had not lost that last round, he probably would have been the favorite to win it. But unfortunately for him, he did to his direct competitor, Raunik Sadwani. So credit. Yeah, if he could have somehow pulled that off. But it really looked like that opening was an improvisation, despite people saying that Knight of Five is what their computer wanted. I mean, it looked like he just didn't quite know this kid's opening. and uh... Desperate times. And yeah, I mean, he made a game out of it, which was like crazy. But uh, you know, against somebody else, I think you could have seen how he would have, how he would have bamboozled them. But uh, not Sidwani, wow. not today. You know, David, I didn't realize how poorly Berlin did, because they started three out of four in the first match, but they finished with eight and a half total points. So out of the remaining six rounds, that's twenty-four possible games, they only scored mm -hmm. five and a half out of twenty-four at the end. That is, yeah. I mean, if you just look at their lineup, they all perform pretty miserably. I'm looking at Khan there. Okay, Jan Christoph Duda, we loved his chest today. Kevin Bordy, five out of seven. Those middle two yeah. boards. Paul Velton had some exciting games, but he was on the losing side of most of them. And Harutian Barstigian, well, you know, he, he did not kind of uh, hold his end of the bargain here. Well, let's run one and a half out of seven. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of excitement, but uh, nobody go anywhere because there's another battle royale today. There's two of these things. Yeah, and we're gonna. I see Danny is just so happy in the chat right now. We're gonna pass it over to Danny Wrench and Alexander Botes. David, it's been yeah. an absolute pleasure. I loved your many checkmate ideas in end games. <laughs> you know, I, I, yeah. it was fascinating. So I had a great time commentating alongside you. Yeah, me too. Team. Thanks, thanks, Robert, for hosting this whole thing. It's really fun. Yeah, my pleasure. So we're going to sign off. Stay tuned because in just less than 10 minutes, and they'll be right on Alexandra and Danny. So thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great day, and enjoy continuing to watch the Pro Chess League.